That's right. Thursday night, guys. Just having an outstanding conversation with the panel before the show. By the way, welcome, everybody. It's going to be a great crossfire for you guys tonight. You know, tonight's one of those nights where we've got a lot of news. There's a lot to cover, but it's a lot of community-made news. You know what I mean? It's a little bit coming from developers, some of it coming from some of the platform holders. And then the rest of it has kind of been just something that's metamorphosized over the course of the week, and we're here to discuss it with you guys. Please do take a few moments, though, as we kind of let everybody trickle in here. I see that guy, Smitty. I see the great Jimmy Harrison's here, Lord Metroid. Uh, shout out even to the, that guy who I was talking to for quite some time before the show even started about the whole 30 FPS thing and what's going on with Dragon's Dogma. We're going to get into that. It's going to be a great conversation. And I do have the developer's quote here, too, if uh, that guy's still here. It was a really good conversation. Uh, that being said, guys, hit that like button if you would as you kind of come in here. Tweet it out. Let everybody know. Let all those thousands of fantastic people that follow you on X, formerly known as Twitter, to go ahead and come on over to the show. We are going to have one outstanding show. We've got a great panel for you, as you can see. Guys, look at that outstanding description for a second, will you? I submitted that into my boss for approval. It didn't get one red pen. Not one slash of red pen on it. That's how good that description is right there. And right above that description is the join button. Uh, I want to say shout out to MASH. MASH was here last week when we had Reforge on, and MASH gifted 20 subs during the show. I have to say thank you to MASH. I don't know if MASH is here in the audience tonight or will listen later, but I do want to tip my cap and say thank you to him very, very much. That being said, I've put the new Mooch Maniac family members on the list. You can see if you scroll down right underneath that great description is the Mooch Maniac family members channel. And you can see your name in there, and I will call them out one by one. I've been gaming with these guys. We've been playing a lot of Helldivers too, A lot of back and forth on what's going on with Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, which we'll get into tonight. But let me give a shout out to these great individuals one by one. The great Judah Zook, Willie Gamer, Mumble Ranting Gaming, Tyson Webb 509, True Witty, Alfonso Carter, Brap, who's taking the night off, he said, but I still think he'll pop in. For some reason, I still think he's going to pop in. He's like, Mooch, I don't think I can make it tonight. I said, listen, that's a 50-50 shot. I still think Brap's popping in. We'll see. Damien, the great Jimmy Harrison, Andy Hart, Red Hood 420, Ham Solo 05, Rob Jones, Night Ripper 7, Toto Dope, Thumbs Thumbs, JC 2013, Lord Metroid, Rabbit Got the Gun, Fastbender, Arch War Angel, shout out to Arch War, Biggity 08, Slow Mo Backslap, shout out to Slow Mo and the great Gaming Forte. We're doing DPS, 9 p.m. Eastern Thursdays, right after this show. Henry Heck, Silent Merc, who's here, Ice Queen Gaming, shout out to Dawn, Ocelot, who's been playing a lot of Helldivers with the Mooch, j 49 our Major Mooch Maniacs, a lot of new names here, Chad Studd, Chris Coleman, Game Exp, love that, I should just say Game EXP, A2, Kenneth, Cal, Cryptopsy, The Elemental Hero, Kenneth Williams, Warawana, Rick L, True Virgil, shout out to True Virgil, Mass Exodus, Connor Garotti. I'm not sure if I'm saying that right. Nixie. Corey Massey. Game Knobs. Brian East. Craig the Tech Guy. You guys know Craig. Craig may be stopping by later on as well. Toolman55. Shout out to MASH again. There's MASH right there. Ekim. Bitrate. RPG88. Christian the Bad Gamer. Forest Star General. Truth Serum. Your boy Roy. Scolari Brothers. DC Gaming. Miko. Jay Bari. And Gaming with Persona. I believe they're back Saturday, 11 a.m. Eastern Time. Guys, that's how I start my Saturday. It's how I recommend you guys start yours with whoops. What's up, PlayStation? Shout out to both those guys. Tactical Gamer, Danelle Brown, that guy Smitty, Brian B, a.k.a. Delirium Blades, and our VIP Mooch Maniacs, the wise old gamer, Raji and Domino Zero, and our honorable mentions, they're out there without food, water, or toilet, come home, Passive Prophet, Selene Chilean, General Thad Ape, Shadow Assassin, and our forever Mooch Maniacs, Longshot 316, and the great optimus code that being said guys i see a lot of you guys out there i see ryan landis there's true virgil mooch need to put the show on game pass because i'm not buying true virgil listen someone gifted it to you okay take it from a mooch you take a gift you take a gift shout out to true virgil there's tool man i see neil augusto dr martin van nostren great to have you here as well jc 20, 2013 pardon me guys let's get this outstanding panel that i have for you and i have a lot of questions to put them on the hot seat for and I know that you guys are going to be very opinionated tonight. So please do ask your questions. We will get to them one by one. Uh, let me start with the great David Faulkner, who's with us. And David, I got to say, you know, you were talking a little accounting with me behind the scenes here. Uh, but speaking before that, last week you were supposed to come on the show. I overbooked and I said, David, is there any way we can get you on this week? You said, Mooch, we can make that happen. David, a lot of people have been asking for you to be back on the show. How are you doing this evening or for you this afternoon? 
Uh, yeah, no trouble at all. Always happy to be here. Um, doing well. Lovely day outside. Sun is shining. We made it to Friday. Friday afternoon. Here we come. Um, and just my luck, I've got a long weekend ahead of me. So perfect way to get, get the afternoon started. Having a chat amongst friends, amongst gamers, amongst like-minded people with an audience that's going to be absolutely on fire in the chat. So looking forward to this one. I appreciate that, David. I uh, got the great TCMF with us. You guys know, you know, TC, he sometimes can get, uh, I see him get a little riled up on this show every once in a while. That's why sometimes I've got to <laughs> bait him in. You know, I'm like, TC, it's a good week, TC. This is good news. It's all good vibes. He's like, all right, Mooch, I'll come on. I'll come on, but keep it, keep it positive. The great TC's with us. TC, how are you doing tonight, buddy? I'm doing good. I'm going to get excited for the show. Uh, curious what discussions you're going to have in here. Oh, Listen, you never know what you're going to get. It's like that box of chocolates from Forrest Gump. That's the way it is. It's fantastic. <laughs> what makes no, it nice live, to be back here. Right? It's what makes the show so great. Speaking of that, we've got a great, great guest with us here. Great to be able to have the great Spawn Wave back with us. You guys know from Spawn Wave Media, if you don't, shame on you guys. Does a great news show every single morning. Does a great podcast on Saturday evenings. Spawn, it's been way too long, but you know, it's 2024 and I had to get you in here. And I think considering... You have all of the news in front of you. You know what's going on. I'm not going to be pulling any punches over you. You know what's happening. This is a great night to have you on the show. Spawn, how are you doing this evening? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. As mentioned, we're going into Friday, so looking forward to the looking forward to the weekend. But Boy. good to be here. Talk about we got Dragon's Dogma 2, Frame Rate, Final Fantasy 7, Rebirth. Playing oh, yeah. a lot of that, so I'm I'm on board there. Well, you know what, Spawn? Honestly, some some of that is the meat and potatoes. The one thing that usually would catch the center of a show would be the Xbox partner preview, but I'm going to start with that spawn. I'm going to put you on the hot seat. So, you know, a couple of questions here. I know you watched it, but when it comes down to it, I have a couple of the games here that I'll list for you in a moment, just in case you refresh your memory. But what games were shown from the third party publishers that you didn't expect to see, first of all, and I'm going to follow that up a bit later with the whole, what was Xbox's real point here? I mean, we, we know that they've got those four games, some are saying five with As Dusk Falls, going over to PlayStation in the coming months. But when you see a show like this now, before this used to be something that would really kind of, you know, uh, entangle the, 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 the Xbox community and get them excited and say, listen, this is why I have Xbox, this is why I have Game Pass. What did you see from the partner preview that really excites the customer to either go out and buy a series console or to subscribe to Game Pass. I mean, what were your overall thoughts on the show? And if you need a refresher, I do have some of the games right here I could list off for you. Uh, I got them all in front of me here. Four, okay. There were 14, 14 games were shown. Took yes. about 30 minutes. Uh, I, I feel like the, I mean, the highlights for most people probably are the Persona 3 Reload expansion pass that's just going to be part of Game Pass Ultimate, but the fact that there's a new episode. I, I thought having the, the Stalker Legends the zone trilogy. I thought that was a pretty cool announcement and it just came out immediately. Yep. But I, I am looking at the, the overall list of games and it's, it's definitely a list that's more for forgettable over time. Like, I, I don't think this is one that people are look back on and be like, remember that partner showcase that Microsoft had, you know, like even a month from now, even a week, probably some people didn't even know what it happened. So I, it just kind of felt like these are obligations that Microsoft had with third parties and they just rolled it all up into what was really just a show of trailer after trailer after trailer. They didn't have a host, nothing like that. Mm -hmm. And they just, they pasted them all together. They did a live stream. It was a little event for it. And that was kind of it. If I had to pick a, a, a game that I guess I wasn't expecting going in, but I'm at least curious how it's going to turn out. Maybe sleight of hand. That was where they showed kind of like a, uh, it looked like an action mystery adventure game with cards involved somehow. But yes. that's maybe the only one I can look at here i mean at monster jam showdown i didn't expect that there but it's not one that i'm like thinking back on too much well, so spawn, it's, did spawn, are any of these going to end up and by the way tc and david feel free to jump in when you want on this subject but spawn did are any of these going to be exclusive to xbox this i i took this as being a third party deal everything that we saw some of those the upper hand would be that they're going to be in game pass day one but other than that i i would assume that these are going to end up on on other platforms as well yeah, 
Yeah, this is just a third party show. I mean, I guess uh, Stalker. I, I don't know if that was on other platforms as well. The the Legends of the yes, Stalker. It, 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 it's on, on everything. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. on PlayStation yeah. as well. I saw it on PlayStation. I did not see if it went to to uh, pardon me to Switch. That I don't know. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, I don't know about the, the Switch. But yeah, it's like so, an old game, but I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that was from way back when on the PC, but it, most of the stuff here, I would assume, is also on PlayStation. Like, this is just a third-party showcase, really, so I wasn't... I was really looking at this as, okay, they sold everyone on Game Pass or something like that, and it's just, here's games you can get, and that's kind of it. Well, TC... Is Stalker, is Stalker on uh, Game Pass, the the trilogy? No, that, no that, that trilogy's for sale. I think you can buy, like, the... First, you can buy one of them for twenty dollars, and they have the whole trilogy as forty. Okay, no, because if if because I I want I've never played the original Stalkers, and I'm a I'm a fan of the Metro franchise, the entire franchise, and mm. I've heard people say Stalker is like uh, the other, the other version, or for people who really like Stalker, they say Metro is the other, but obviously Metro, there's been more games, right? I think yeah, there's been more games than Stalker. Stalkers had these three and the new one that's coming out. Mm -hmm. And uh, so yeah, I've I've been curious about uh, checking out the the old games before um, the new one comes out. So this is perfect. I, I just didn't know if it was uh, on. I thought it would have been on Game Pass, but I guess it's not. It's just sold separately. That would have been a good yeah. one to have on Game Pass because the new one. It is interesting because Stalker Two is on Game Pass, but yeah. these aren't. That, that was a little weird. I, right. I feel like. Okay, well that that is that is odd. I mean, myself personally, the reason that I kind of bring up a few of the points that I make here is not necessarily the games themselves. Some of the games did look pretty good. You said sleight of hand. The one that I see people ranting and raving about is the altars, which is where you are this this individual, and in order to make whether it be the process or that big wheel or your ability to get yourself off of this planet. You need to have multiple people, but you're alone. You find this capability to be able to make different alter egos of yourself, and you're allowed to do that, and it actually does progress the game that way, and I believe the sun is harmful. I thought that was an interesting one, but a lot of times those games look really good, like they're really visually appealing, but the, it, there's not a lot of substance. There's still more to be found on that. But I found a lot of people in the community writing last night, and I was just scrolling through Twitter, pardon me, X, if you will, and they were saying, I didn't even know Xbox had a showcase today. And I guess where I'm just kind of taking this conversation a bit, I'll, and TC, I'll start with you, is sure. now that Xbox has done what they've done and, and, and they're seemingly sending certain games over to to PlayStation and Switch and uh, Silk Knight, who happens to be one of the, like the, the newer insider folks that's been calling things recently, you guys can take that in the audience as you will. Um, you know, he's saying expect, you know, Starfield to come over to PS5 this holiday. Expect even yeah, more later, titles later. to come over right next year. So it, when when Xbox more 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 hard, more Xbox traditional titles. That was the thing that took me. That sounds like a like a Gears, like a Gears or a Halo, right? Yeah, like for 2025. I I still it's hard for me to think those games would. Me too. That's still Xbox centric. That's just like Xbox. That's like Xbox Soul, like Gears of War, Halo. That's like that's Xbox. I it just it would be weird to see it elsewhere, but. Yeah, but there's a, go ahead, David. There's a, um, as I said, there's a sub point as to why they would have to do that, but it's yeah, probably yeah. A, a five to ten minute TED talk style explanation. So, I just I think that the the question I have for you guys is is does it somewhat lose as Xbox losing a little bit of their their pull? When I saw a lot of people say, "Geez, I didn't even know Xbox had a show yesterday." I understand it's third party; it's not the same thing as what they do in June. It's not their big show. But I was starting to see just a little bit of that like lack of enthusiasm, even from the Xbox faithful. It really wasn't a lot of talk about it. I didn't see a lot of people doing videos on it. And even Spawn, I said Spawn, you know, and Spawn's like, yeah, you know, I, yeah, I covered it and I got the games right here. Nothing really, you know, think that, you know, and, and Spawn, by the way, I'm, I'm not putting words in your mouth. I kind of feel the same way you did. I feel like in a short period of time, it's either these games, one of those games may hit, one of them may not. But it will never be correlated or, or or associated with the Xbox brand, where before those types of things were a little bit more. Um, so that's one of my things. Shout out, by the way. I see uh, uh, Luchi Sky here. I see DeFloyd. Great to see all you guys here. Please do hit the like button, guys. Tweet it out. Um, I don't know. David, what do you think? Is this something that... Was there, was the show anything worthwhile to you? Any, any game stand out? Uh, yeah. One ga game that stood out was Tales of Kenzera. Ken Zao. That yes. thing looks... Really cool, um, and I've heard that the developers or the, the director, the guy who concepted it, um, I've heard him speaking about the game. He was on a PlayStation podcast. He was on the, at X TGA. Um, 
when they announced it, he's done a, he- a couple of things with Xbox uh, as well, the PC ones. Um, it looks really cool. Uh, to answer your original question um, around what's going on, Microsoft just has never had a big budget to to do marketing outside of their, their big tentpole games. They've always relied on, I call it the ground game. They have their influences and their their core supporter base spread the word. And the, at the moment, the core supporter base is pretty pissed off with them. So <laughs> they're not exactly spreading the good word all that hard. And there was nearly no marketing for that that um, developer, um, the, the partner's whatever they called it. Sorry, I can't think of what they called it. Now, uh, the partner's showing or whatever it was. Um, and they sort of missed a the trick there because it was a good opportunity to, you know, promote that, hey, we still have third party. We still have indies. We still engage with this stuff. You know, we're, we're not we're not all about just what we do internally and sending everything everywhere. But it was a bit of a shame that they just don't take it as seriously as I'd like them to. Um, and... And there's some really good games that were shown that unfortunately just they get shown elsewhere in a better light. Yeah, no, I I, I do agree with you. I, I think when it comes down, I'm seeing the audience here. The audience is kind of agreeing with everything we're saying here on the panel. Not a whole lot going on. Hero Down Under says, uh, Unknown 9 Awakening stood out because I've been waiting for it. I thought that game did have a little bit of, of, of push to it as well, Hero. I thought that was very good. But for some reason, like I said, I think the one thing that right now Xbox is trying to do is sell Game Pass. Um, I don't know if necessarily the hardware, and that's where I kind of ask you, Spawn, you've covered this in bits and pieces over the courses of, since I would say since that Xbox business podcast was announced, you're seeing a lot more people that are saying that that Xbox's emphasis on hardware may be declining as we go through the rest of this generation. I know that they're going to have some sort of maybe two terabyte Xbox Series X that's a, a diskless version, uh, maybe a slightly enhanced controller, but a lot of questions about next generation's hardware spawn. Do you think that we're going to see a drastic difference coming out of Xbox versus I think Sony will do more traditional, you know, beefier kind of uh, GPU, uh, et cetera, moving, you know, same status quo as we've gone from generation to generation, but Xbox may be taking a, a bit of a different route. Do you agree, Spawn? Oh yeah, I think I think Microsoft's going to do something kind of weird for next generation. I don't think it's going to be as traditional as people maybe have been used to, but I, I think they'll tie AI into it in some way, and it's probably something that's really difficult for us to conceptualize now. But I I think it's going to be a very strange system, or we'll just say product for now that they're gonna they're gonna show off. You think it'll be a hybrid of sorts, Spawn? Where we're talking about possibly a handheld. Well, yeah, I, I think both I, companies are going for that in terms of yeah. having a handheld and uh, and a console. Sorry, go ahead. No, I I think you're right. I think right now the just the overall console market is you could say I'd say at minimum stagnant, but you could even make the case that just the traditional high end box market is actually starting to decline or shrink a little now. Mm-hmm. And at that point, if you're a business like that, you got to pivot, you got to figure out what to do. And I feel like these, these mobile chips are getting better and better as we've gone, just seeing what like a rog ally, a steam deck, the Legion go. And that's like AMD's first real shot at it. Yeah. And now Intel's getting involved. Nvidia apparently is getting involved. And when you have that kind of, that kind of market cap fighting back and forth between these big chip companies, usually you get better products from it. So I kind of feel like we're one generation off maybe of these low power chips, or I mean, at that point they might be, (laughs) there might be a little more power involved, but they would be able to more or less do what we're seeing now, but in smaller form factors. So I feel like the hybrid approach works for Nintendo. And I, I, I feel like Sony and Microsoft realize that. And it's, I think See, it's something they're going to pursue in some way. <laughs> the thing about no, it, honestly, though, uh, go ahead, TC, but I got I got no TC. I want to hear your point, but I do have a comment on, on how my, Microsoft and Sony may have a different dynamic when it comes to a handheld. Go ahead. No, I was going to say, um, Back in, in 2017, when I first held a Nintendo Switch, I still remember <laughs> the words I, I, I said when I first got my Switch and I had it for that, for that night and then the next day, is that back then, I wished Sony would have something similar to it. I wished Sony would have something that was a handheld and a hybrid that you can uh, dock onto your TV and then start playing. I thought Nintendo had something it's not to sound corny, magical in 2017. Um, so I'm happy to hear that 
Sony and uh, Microsoft are potentially going down, even though it's not like a full hybrid where, you know, the home console is still the home console and the handheld is more like a, except not accessory, it's a additional access because it's not a portal. It's, it's still, a, you can play this anywhere you want to go and stuff like that. But I'm happy that they're they're taking that approach going forward. Yeah, but TC, so just to kind of go forward with that, so if we're talking about next generation, yeah. I could see Sony doing what they did in the past where they would have a dedicated handheld, but it would be, uh, how do I, I don't want to use the word complementary. I want to say... Uh, it's complementary, right? I would say that. Okay, complementary yeah. to what will be a PS5 Pro or a PS6. I think Microsoft may go a little bit more closer to the drawing of what Nintendo did, right? Where they'll have the handheld then be docked or not and moving forward in that retrospect. I, I do, Because think about it, when you're talking about Game Pass and you look at a Game Pass library... Yes, there are certain games that are definitely graphically intense, and then there's other ones where you know they're pick up and go and very easily you know able to play. I think one of you said it already: Steam Deck success, things of that nature. You know, so it'll be more powerful than a Steam Deck. But but you know, in that same world, I don't think Sony does that. I think Sony still needs that dedicated piece of hardware that we've traditionally gotten used to under our television sets or in your entertainment center. Yeah, I can see that. I can see, like, yeah. it makes sense because the thing about it is, Sony still sells consoles. The thing that the X, the thing Xbox has an issue with is they don't sell consoles, regardless of how much they want to talk about how it's not a priority for them. It's not a priority, not by choice. It's not a priority by force because it's yeah. it's the reality of the way things things are. People don't buy your console. Unfortunately, I wish they, I wish it was more popular. Um, yeah. But uh, Sony doesn't have that issue. So Sony's already, from what we're hearing from like reports, Sony's already on the ball for uh, the PlayStation Six, and that's why we're hearing the f the first like early discussions of this potential handheld that they'll that they'll make. Sony's already on the next thing going forward. And I've heard that in terms of Xbox going forward, it's a bit hazy. But then I hear from other people saying, no, Xbox also has something set. They're ready to go. They're they're gonna go at twenty twenty six. They're they're oh they already figured it out fully. They're coming they're coming early. Um, so I'm curious to see what happens in the next next uh, next two years for that. If Xbox does anything in twenty twenty six, it'll be I think it would be a drastic pivot, and it would it would probably be something like a handheld Steam Deck. Shout out to the great Dr. Martin Van Nostrand, by the way. He says just make a portal, and he's calling it a portal. I would call it more of like a. Uh, a, a PSP of some sort, you know, uh, that you can download all your digital games. I don't want to buy two different formats, and the devs don't want to make two different formats. Uh, I agree with the great doctor that's there. Um, that's something that we do not want to see again. We don't want to have to buy those. What are those things called? I can't remember on the PSPs. The, the, U, the UH, UMDs? UMDs. Thank you. I was going to call it UHD. The UMDs. Yeah, I, I love those. I still... I, 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 they, they were, they were fun back then. They uh, were fun, it, but like the thing is, though, it, it is a drastic difference. I think the way now yeah, is yeah. you want to do what Steam did, right? I want to be able to have my PS6. We'll use PS6 for the example, and then if I take this thing on the road, I want to be able to have it natively play on this device. I mean, so what I think is gonna, what what I think is gonna happen because the rumor right now is that this portable is gonna be playing PlayStation Five and PS4 games, and that library is already vast so if that's the the focus there because mm -hmm. it's interesting the rumor doesn't say ps6 games because if this is a part of the ps6 line family you would think it would play playstation 6 games but i assume this is the case because sony doesn't want to you know back to the earlier point you were making sony wouldn't want to uh limit their console uh just to you know try to make it work with like you know the power of the handheld so they want to be able to give the developers the most power they can get with the with the playstation 6 and the rumor right now is it's going to be playing PlayStation 5 and uh, PlayStation 4 games. So I wonder if they're going to do a partly what they did with the portal, where you want to play PlayStation 6 games, you can stream those. But if you want right. to play digital games, you can, like, uh, you know, on your system, you can download PlayStation 5 and PlayStation 4 games. And people have to remember uh, that, or even right now, there's still PlayStation 4 games getting released in 2024. Like, yeah. there's... Yeah. There's still PlayStation 4 games getting released. So, say 2027 or 2028 when this thing get, uh, launches, those there's still going to be PlayStation 5 games coming out. And I wouldn't be surprised if people are still playing PlayStation 4 games. Uh, Is by that something? Then. So, so this, Dave, you know, David, from a financial point, TC makes a point. David, what do you think? Is it? 
is that something where, you know, we say we believe in generations. If there still is content coming out for the PS4, and we see the yeah. sales numbers, right? The, the PS4 is actually still selling. I mean, is it selling great? No. But it's still selling. Is is that something that maybe... is? What, I don't see the actual reason to continue selling it at this point. I did understand the first two years, especially with the scarcity of the PS5s you know, out there for retail. Um, mm-hmm. what, what's the logic right now from a business standpoint, Dave? Well, it depends on which part of the business you are. If you're PlayStation themselves, there's no point in selling old hardware. But if you are a developer and there's still 120 million PS4s in existence in the world and 100 million of them are plugged in and are operating every day, why wouldn't you take the cost-saving exercise to build a game that works on a PS4 and then can be run on a PS5 anyway and put it out there? It's, you know, you're talking about spending maybe 10 or $15 million developing a game that that you can then have a user base of 150 million potentially. Yeah. So it, it comes down to who's 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 looking through the lens and what lens are we looking through. Um, just in terms of the PS6 stuff though, if they do deploy the, um, the and there's food for thought because this is the kind of stuff that they think of, if they deploy the dual G- the twin GPU model that they've been testing, yes, and they use that to run out their um, cloud gaming system right. on, effectively every PS6 can then become a Blade server. And it's not housed in a warehouse full of servers somewhere, it's sitting in your living room. Mm. So you can be playing that and somebody can be streaming something from the same unit, a la two people can now play using a port PlayStation portal in the house off one unit. And Sony gets you because you've got to spend the money to do it. Or... It fixes a latency issue if your neighbor's trying to st- stream a game from a PlayStation server. Mm. But the benefit to that to Sony is they're not housing them in a warehouse and having to pay the occupancy cost for the warehouse, the energy cost for the warehouse, the cost of all the other stuff to go along with maintaining the warehouse and the Blade servers. That's now on the consumer. The consumer's paying the electricity to run the Blade server. The consumer's <laughs> paying for the upkeep yes. on it. That's cost Wait, shifting. Are you, That's where are they're you referring at. To, are you referring to... Clients being able to access people's consoles? So they would, at, if you want to stream a game over cloud yeah. streaming, that the service would find the nearest available console that has capacity to run that game and use it. Uh, uh, so you're getting into a minefield uh, of a million other problems, but yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know how, I don't know how legally that would be something that people would be okay with to have their console being used by somebody else i don't maybe for your own personal use but that's I what i was that. thinking i was thinking more of per, for personal use or there would have to be some sort of a you know password of some sort but i would love that idea if like people were if people were all right all right with it because then it would yes it would have a benefit for the latency problem because then you would essentially have everything around you but you know that's also another way of trying to make the internet work without you know with everybody using their phones and you've been able to connect you want to get to a piece of file somewhere connect to this guy's phone this guy's phone going all the way here and that's a connection but that's a yeah. privacy issue nobody's gonna i'm not suggesting that that's what they're going to end up doing but that's oh, the okay. sort of considerations that they are looking at going well what's what makes most sense for us to a shift cost and b develop that out and then work out what what are we going to do because if if they went, yes, we'll put a dual, dual core or a dual CPU um, structure into our PS6 so that you, someone can be playing a game and someone can be using the portable or multiple people can be logged into that console to use the portable, then um, there's, there's an uplift there straight away. Um, and as you said before, with the technology, the chips get smaller and more powerful every time. Um, depending on what the cloud server offering is, it may just be like a login point to get access to the servers. Um, they could quite easily be dramatically increasing the amount of people that can be playing at, at any single time on a unit. But the trade-off to that is they'll probably sell less units. So it's a balancing act. Yeah. No, it, it'll be interesting. I just thought it was... It, it's It's good food for thought for everyone out there because... It is interesting that we're talking about this already. We are at the mid-gen. Usually this conversation comes up a year after we start talking about PS6 or the next Xbox after the mid-gen refreshes. And here we are. We still haven't gotten anything from Sony saying that a PS5 Pro, I think it's the worst kept secret in the world. 
PS5 Pro looking like it will either come latest would be, I believe, early spring of next year, or it would be holiday of this year is more what I'm leaning towards. Uh, and they have a bunch well, of... Well, remember how the PS4 Pro got announced. Probably going to be the same thing. I thought the PS4 Pro was announced in like a September. spring, wasn't it? Was it September? Oh, you're right. It was September, September October, yeah. was it not? You're yeah. all right. TC, great memory on you, by the way. If no one <laughs> said that. Um, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, you'll see, sorry, you'll see if they, they'll flag it in their quarterly reports, when you see a massive uplift in inventory, they'll drop in that next quarter. Say it one more time, I'm sorry. Um, if, if there's a massive uplift in held inventory for PlayStation, yes, then you'll then the, 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 the Pro will be dropping in that next quarter. Okay. Yeah. So, what it, so we don't know, but what's your prediction, David? Well, they unloaded a heap of inventory in the December quarter, and they were saying in their, their reports that they weren't going to be restocking that inventory in the March quarter, but we should expect something in the June quarter well, to return to larger stock levels, which would line up with a September launch. Well, I don't know about you guys. I know Spawn's going to do it for, uh, let's just call it business purposes, Spawn, because I know you even went out. Spawn even went out and got the Slim uh, PS5, which, by the way, I got to tell you, part of me is jealous for you guys out there that have the Slim. I mean, I have the two day one uh, physical disc edition PS5, which, by the way, they're fine. They're great. Nothing wrong with it. But I see how slim the Slim really I'm calling it a Slim. I don't think PlayStation called it a Slim. It is. You know, but it no, is. No, they, 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 they actually call it Slim on the stock. Yeah. They oh, do. are they now? But okay, it's, not, I... it's not that Slim. It's not that Slim. I got my wife it... bought one um, weekend before last. It put the second one in our house. Yes. And she went, oh, I didn't get the base plate. I forgot to get the base plate. We pulled it out of the box. You don't need the base plate. No, you, you don't. You don't need the base plate. It is thick. It is still thick it's, at the it, bottom. It's not. It, lo it looks pretty slim from the picture. I haven't, I haven't held it. I myself. think it's the waistline that gets slim because, you know, David's right. It does stand still on its own. Spawn, you have it. Did you all, Spawn, I think you also bought the vertical stand. I can't remember if you did or didn't. I did. I did. It, it, it's unnecessary, though. It, it, it's very difficult to tip it over. Like, you'd have to really think about knocking it over to do it. <laughs> or have a cat. Have a cat. That'll sort the, that'll get it on its side real fucking quickly. <laughs> that'll work, too. Yeah. Cat'll do it anytime. Uh, all right. So, sli slightly switching over gears, guys, because I do want to get to the, some of the meat and potatoes for tonight. I know the audience is kind of chomping at the bit. You'll see a lot of Final Fantasy footage. So, some of this here is pre rendered, some of it. Uh, clips and then I have some gameplay that follows. I've been I'm about 16 hours in uh, via the PS5 counter. If you'll take that for granted, and I'm only in chapter two. I will get in a lot more of that game time in this weekend. But spawn so many things to talk about in Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. Of course, we can we can start with the game itself. You can give me your quick synopsis on it if you're enjoying it. What your thoughts are. But really, I kind of want to read uh, a tweet that you did earlier today, and I actually said out on Twitter, you know, I said, Spawn's going to be with us. I want to talk about this. Spawn, you said, Final Fantasy VII Rebirth sales coming in soft in Japan, despite being a great game, are going to have us go through a bunch of the different reasons before asking the obvious question, is Final Fantasy just declining? So you put that tweet out. It definitely got a lot of, it got a lot of movement. Um, Spawn, I guess I would say to you, First of all, I looked at the chart of numbers. I saw how your your statement makes sense, especially starting back at I believe the the, the chart that was you know posted shortly after your comment started at like you know Final Fantasy five six seven, and the numbers were quite large. You know it was in the millions the first week, and then now we're down to the two hundred and sixty two thousand. But that again is using Japan sales records, and that's fine. Japan sales records is not generally what we go by. We go by and that's physical as well. I believe. So is this is this do you think spawn a true testament to the decline of Final Fantasy or is it just a you know it's a it, metrics are just measured differently than they were in the days of Final Fantasy five six seven eight even upwards of fifteen uh, we've gone from digital being uh, at best back when fifteen came out was probably sixty forty physical to where we're almost at a seventy thirty or eighty twenty digital so spawn is it is it really a telling tale of the, of of the of the saga of Final Fantasy declining, or is it just uh, the metrics have changed and we have to wait for more data? I I think you could make a good case for Final Fantasy declining in Japan specifically. Okay, like, I I think I think that is something that's happening, uh, and I mean we can go to just Final Fantasy sixteen. I mean it's it's down 
quite a bit. Like I was actually surprised. I thought Rebirth would yeah. outsell sixteen in its first week, but it's. I mean, it's down what like 70, 70, units, yeah, 70 hundred, thousand units. Yeah, almost a hundred. Yeah, almost a hundred thousand. Yeah. And I, I was surprised at that because sixteen went through a whole its whole whole controversy about it just being basically Devil May Cry, just about like it, it, people saying it's not a Final Fantasy game, but it actually outsold seven rebirth and i think seven rebirth is a better game than 16 but it didn't really seem to matter and then seven rebirth also is tapping the nostalgia of seven so i mm-hmm. i felt like that was going to do really well out of the gate and it so far at least in japan physically has not and they made a big deal about getting it on two blu-rays and how it's 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 a game you can buy physically and it's all there for you and i a little surprised because in japan there is so in like the West, the digital is taking over much more than it is in Japan. Japan Correct. still has yeah. a lot of physical buyers. Uh, but I just think over time with Final Fantasy specifically, because I I, I do have like a podcast with uh, some of the younger gamers as well, mm-hmm. newer, the newer generation, if you will. They just don't seem that interested in Final Fantasy. And I'm a little yeah. surprised on that. But then I thought about it. Whenever I talk about Final Fantasy and how good the series is, I go. I have to always go back to like the PS2. Yeah, like I, I don't know if there's a Final Fantasy game recently that I would go to and say that's just a great Final Fantasy. Like I, I went through. I'm like, it's not 15, 16 again is kind of viewed as like an action game more than anything, and uh, like 12 maybe is the last one I can go to, and that was on the PS2 almost 20 years ago. So it's if you think about it that way, a new gamer coming in who's 16, 17 years old, mm-hmm. they don't even know what that is. So <laughs> it's. I just wonder if Final Fantasy's kind of kind of lost some of the so, just the gaming population a bit. So Spawn, you you kind of spark something in my mind that makes some sense, and what you're saying holds water. If you think about it, that would actually your reasoning there on your last part of your statement holds water to why Final Fantasy 16 may have sold a bit better than Rebirth. Uh, Rebirth is taking you into parts of you know seven broken up. So someone like you say, maybe someone who's between the ages of 16 and 24 has gotten into the earlier. Uh, Final Fantasies, the new Final Fantasies, whether you're talking about uh, 15, 16, and probably 17 moving forward, you don't have to play any of the others to enjoy Final Fantasy 16. You could have picked up Final right. Fantasy 16 and it's your first Final Fantasy experience and been blown away and had no recollection of what was going on in the prior 15. Now, that's not the case for Rebirth. That may well, play a I role. I think you could... I could you could probably go into Rebirth, watch the little video they have that's Absolutely. like yes. catching you up. Yes. And then they explain to you that it's a reimagining. So while seven knowing seven obviously is going to give you a lot more context and a lot more, oh, okay, I, I remember that part. That's cool. You could you could technically go into Rebirth and play it and be like, okay, the gameplay is good. The world exploration's fun. Mm-hmm. Like there there's constant rewarding in the game. I, I get it. This is this is fun. But I don't know if Cloud, Tifa, Barrett, Red 13, Aerith are having the same pull on a generation that just did not grow up with seven like it does for a lot of us. I could see that. So, you know, I'll go over to David. David, you're our numbers guy. Uh, I should should have a a typewriter sound effect going on as soon as I introduce you. But, uh, (laughs) Dave, the other thing that a lot of people were kind of arguing back and forth, this has nothing to do with Spawn's tweet. This was just this conversation's been out and about all day. Is that, you know, Mm. when, 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 Rebirth, pardon me, not Rebirth, but when Remake came out, which Remake sold about 700,000 copies in that time frame, there was a lot more, I mean, there was a lot more PS4s out there than PS5s. Does that, I mean, does that also, because Spawn made a great point with story, uh, the younger gamer maybe not being as in tune with the older Final Fantasies, and then the fact that there just isn't as many PS5s out in the wild as there were PS4s when Remake came out. What do you think? I think that they're all um, valid points. Um, very valid points, but they're also part of a more broader set to go with it. Look at when Remake came out. We're in the middle of lockdowns. What was what were people doing then versus what are they doing now? Um, and yes, the the number of um, consoles available makes it makes a impact, but it's not the only impact. Um, because Final Fantasy Seven, well, you know, Final Fantasy games, any games in that genre aren't targeted at every user of of a an install base and it's i was saying on a, a conversation yesterday i find it very asinine for people to say oh there's 50 million playstations out there they sold a million copies so that's a failure because not everyone bought them like the best-selling games on the planet don't even reach 40 or 50 percent install base across 
total potential users. So mm-hmm. what was the what was the target market? Well, they, it may be down in terms of physical numbers, uh, first week sales in Japan, but is there a local localized reason or is it a more broader reason? We won't know until we see the numbers. Um, there's there's multiple other in, input factors there as well. Um, digital, you know, is is a an increasing in, in its size in terms of purchasing in Japan, um, and it's very different um, in terms of its ability uh, to to penetrate the markets in Japan at the moment um, for uh, physical sales, particularly when when there's an appetite to shift. It's not, you know, Japan's still probably one of the last bastions of physical gaming being a big chunk of their uh, their um, market, but it is diminishing. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. It's it's there's plenty of different reasons why it could be happening. Um, well, I thought and it it's was always a- difficult to compare one to the other because of, I mean, you know, Final Fantasy 16, it didn't launch in February. Um, that was going to be yeah, what well, I was going to say. Yeah. yeah. And fi- the Final Fantasy VII Remake, the first one, I'm pretty sure that didn't launch in the end of February, early March either. I just can't remember when it did. I think it was mid-April, yeah. late April or something. It was April. Yeah, so timing's got a big deal- thing to do with it as well. So, but I mean, I would also, I would also take in to, like, launching in the summer is, is kind of more freeing, while especially launching right now and the games around this period right now. Like, for me, I have... Like I know, I don't know Japan when it comes to like games like Hell Divers, but like I'm, I'm playing through Final Fantasy. I'm like Muchi. I'm only on chapter two, right. um, but that's only because I keep playing Hell Divers. Me too. I keep going back to Hell Divers yeah. too, um, and now they had like a big update going on, and I'm just like in Hell Divers too. When I just, like Final Fantasy is a great game. Like I'm playing it. The bit that I'm playing, it's a great game. Uh, it's just like. Helldivers 2 is like something like different that you're kind of just multiplayer things keep going on with that and like Final Fantasy is not going anywhere and it's right there and there's also Dragon's Dogma 2 coming out soon maybe there's going to be people who want to save money for that or you know Rise of the Ronin or right. any of these because this period right now you is know, like summer is usually quiet it's usually yeah, more quiet one game one game that's come out very recent two games that have come out recently but one that's made a ma- major impact in Japan is Grand Blue Fantasy Relink I know oh, yeah. it's not been released this month but that is a game that a lot of people are playing didn't that and come out earlier this year like in january i think it came out in january back end of yeah. january i think middle yeah. of january so and that that is that is a big title in japan it's not very big outside of japan but it was a big title in japan and you got um you know the we, we spoke on it earlier um the 30 versus 60 fps thing if anyone like me and i can't remember who mentioned it earlier I got the game. Your wife got it as part of a bundle deal when she bought that PlayStation 5 Slim a couple of weeks ago. I haven't even opened the plastic on it. I'm waiting for that performance update to come through before I start playing it. <laughs> I want to play. Thinking. I want to experience the game at its best. I don't want to rush in day one and not get the best experience for the amount of money that we paid for it because I am a tight ass. But <laughs> and that's Wait, that, I, I, which I, game? I don't play games day one and I don't buy them at full price for that very reason. I choose to not support this. Let's just release it and we'll patch it up on the first month or the second month. I'm like, no, I'll buy it from you when you've got the thing finished. Right. Which game were you referring to, David? You said you're going to wait for what? Dragon, Final Dragon Fantasy. Dragon II, right? Oh, okay. <laughs> All of them. All of them. If you send it out and it's not ready, I'm not going to buy it. Um, no, Final Fantasy uh, 7 rebirth it's sitting on my shelf i haven't opened it yet oh you're waiting for the you're waiting for the performance patch yeah Yeah, i'm waiting for them to fix it i'll be honest with you and listen i got news for you man i'm i listen i got 2020 vision i i i'm i'm playing it in the performance mode i'm not gonna sit here and tell you it's you know the best thing i've ever seen but i i'm enjoying the game and there's been nothing at all here's some of the gameplay you're seeing right now i I can't. I'm not going to play it in 30. I'm playing it in the in the performance mode, and and it looks fine. I don't. I don't know. I mean, other people are saying that's fine, which you can say it looks fine, but it doesn't look great. I'm looking forward to the patch. Much, it looks it looks much better on on fidelity. That's yeah. the thing. I'm that sure it does. You know, as, yeah. as the promised, issue, the, right? Sorry, the issue that I deal with is because I look at spreadsheets all day. My eyes are shot, um, and I'm I, unless it's like a proper. So th- again, this gets into game development. I don't want to 
derail the conversation, but unless it's like a um, an anime style art style or it's a cartoony art style where yeah. it's like sort of partially 2D, 2.5D, whatever you want to call it, if it's not that sort of character um, animated, you can tell it where they go for these, you know, real life kind of looks. Mm-hmm. I really struggle with um, games trying to keep vision on. I turn the motion blur off. I turn everything up so that it get the best frame rate possible because otherwise it's just a color on a screen and I, I can't see the detail um, and I would much rather enjoy it uh, than sort of tolerate it. Um, but particularly with Final Fantasy VII because the original was one of my um, most closely held uh, enjoyments of my childhood mm-hmm. and um, I don't want to sully the memory i guess <laughs> no i understand so spawn you know because like i said i wanted to talk about the sales of it and we may even go back a bit to talk about some of that but spawn when it comes down to it that was another big thing was the one of the other controversies was really uh, you know it didn't look its best in performance mode I, i'm i'm telling you right now i'm 16 hours in and i'm i'm enjoying it and there's very few maybe i can pick two different t- occasions where i said I'm seeing something that, that, that is unfavorable to the eye, so I'll say that it's there, but it's not taking away from my experience. Spawn, are, A, are you playing Final Fantasy VII Rebirth currently? And if you are, which mode are you playing it in? And do you feel, do you have the same sediments that the rest of the panel has? Yeah, so I I've, I was switching between the two for a little while to see if I could pick up on like an obvious difference that would ruin the experience. And it is a shame because graphics mode does look like significantly sharper if you're and if you're just standing still it, it's fine but once you start swinging the camera around or getting into a battle it's just it feels like you're underwater yes so it is it is a situation of there's just no perfect way to play this game or even i would say great way to play the game so i just had to go with performance and i just sit further away from your tv really it's uh, <laughs> it's kind of a shame they did say a patch is coming for it yes so we'll see if they can I don't know. Figure something out. Clean know. it up. Maybe maybe do stuff with uh, the the shadows environment. Something to try to get the frame rate acceptable if they decide to move resolution around. But I I'm currently 30 hours in the game. I'm just about done chapter nine. Oh and wow. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah yeah yeah. I'm I'm probably I'm gonna try to have this game beat in the next couple days. But I uh, I I'm getting a kick out of this game. I really really like it. So I. Basically everything around the story so far has been I think good. They're they're going for that reimagining where they're they're taking liberties with the original story, obviously. Yes. Uh and that's the thing that's definitely been pulling me through at this pace is I want to see what happens. Right. Because I, I I'm concerned every day I go online that it's gonna get spoiled for me. So I, I'm just to the point where I'm like, you know, I'm gonna go through at a pretty pretty brisk pace. I- I'm still doing some of the the side stuff as I go if it just happens to be near me. But for the most part, I feel like I'm gonna go back around and I, I don't know new game plus or or something yeah, to, to cl- yeah to clean up the rest of is the game. Is new game you know, plus already baked in, or is that gonna be something coming later? Uh, I I'm not sure. I have to look. I, I'd like to think it's already in there, but either way, I would I would go because of the first one. You would will remake. You would go back and do the different uh, scenarios in hard mode, and you'd get things for your characters and that sort of thing. So I, I'm still trying to figure out if like Queen's Blood, for example, is going to lead to some sort of ultimate weapon or accessory. Like that's usually what happens. So in like eight or nine, you would play the card game, and eventually it'd give you a reward that would play into a character build or something so yes. like i've done all the queen's blood stuff me too uh, which i i, I fun, enjoy that yeah. too it's a lot of fun i i like it for what it is it's cards I, with it's basically cards mixed with chess and I, I think it's very well done so i gotta just piggyback uh, off that real quick and then i'll let uh, uh spawn or pardon me i'll let tc or david chime in i was literally playing match after match the other day and i i looked at the clock and i'm like oh my god it's been it's been almost 40 minutes and i'm playing queen's blood I I generally, I would say 95% of the time, there was a card game even in, I believe, Horizon Forbidden West. I I didn't want nothing to do with it. Didn't care. No interest. I don't know why. And it's not, maybe it's because this game spawned. Let's be honest. This game kind of forces you to play this game. You know, uh, Queen's Blood. So it does. well, oh, it, I mean, will. It, will, it will. It will. It will eventually. Will. You, you'll have to at least play four or five rounds of it. Uh, yeah, you have to play. You do have to play some rounds of it. I'm not saying like TC. I'm not saying you have to become an expert in it, but it does make you play the game. But I've actually enjoyed it. 
I actually went on a, a few quests that I went out and I actually earned better cards. Uh, yep. When I had some extra uh, in-game currency, I bought some cards. Uh, I never would do that in another game. I'm enjoying this. I've actually purposely, it's on. It's actually on screen right now. I, I put a few rounds that I played on here just because I was like, you know what? I, I, I wonder if the audience would like to see. They're not going to see or learn anything from this video. But I'm saying to you that it, it really was a, a fun part of the game. And that's the thing I think that this game is really... It's it's grabbed me a lot more than even remake. I I love the open world. Um, I love the way that you can explore uh, the chocobos and how they're using that, and how you can actually get more items as you use them. It encourages you to use them, or you could just walk or run um, because you can find different items uh, throughout the world. There's a lot going on there. TC, uh, do you oh, agree, yeah. or uh, how do you feel about the game overall? Oh, I'm enjoying it so far. Like the thing for me with Final Fantasy, and it was. It was my issue with the remake as well, and others might disagree. It's just it, it, the the games feel they they feel like they they I, it feels like they pad the games a bit, and uh, and remake it feels like, it, like that game could have been much tighter than what it was. But the story, the characters, the uh, the gameplay, like I, when I first tried out the demo for Final Fantasy VII remake, I didn't like the combat at the beginning. <laughs> uh, but then once you get used to it. Um, <laughs> You, you, you kind of uh, enjoy it. The one thing I, I don't know, maybe somebody can correct me. Could Cloud traverse the way he does in Rebirth and Remake? Because he traverses pretty well in, in Rebirth. Like how I'm, like he automatically jumps through everything, this left and right. Was that in Remake? I don't remember I don't, that. I don't believe it was as fluent as it is well, in Rebirth. No. Remake was very I, I, closed yeah. off. It felt yeah, like yeah, really yeah. claustrophobic most. It's like this, you have, uh, you have like much larger areas to run around in. So I feel yeah, like I Cloud does move better but there's still a lot of challenges when there's verticality in the, oh, yeah. in the game and yes. climbing up certain hills that he can and some he can't and then you look at the map and it's not clear how to get to one part of the map be like because oh, it, it, it doesn't format. show yeah it doesn't it doesn't yeah, it doesn't show like uh uh, maybe some of the landscape being higher than other parts. Like if they played around with the map and figured that out, I think it'd be easier to traverse because there's a few points that I, I've I've gone through where I don't. I it took longer than it should have. I'll say to what seems like just walking across the map because you have to take certain hills basically or paths that they have to get mm -hmm. up to one level, and then you go over to the other, and then go up again, and then down, and then up again, and it's. Right. It's, Which it's is difficult weird. because it's a flat looking map. Because the thing is, it's it's weird that so one of the things that I love about Ghost of Tsushima, one of my favorite things that I love about Ghost of Tsushima, is, and it might it might sound like ridiculous to some people, but it's the 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 guiding system. The guiding system is very immersive in the game, and it kind of just directs you in a way to go. Uh, mm -hmm. In in Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, they have these little twinkles that pop up from. <laughs> Like randomly, like when you're close, not random, but when you're close to your objective, like when you're you're going into a barn and the guy you're supposed to speak to is there. I don't know why they don't incorporate something where you click on something and it kind of just those sparkles just come out again and then kind of guide you to where as an option. Some people could turn it off, but right. like some of the issues that I've seen, like like you're mentioning, I've seen from other people online when it comes to rebirth that they've been stuck in places and they're like, I had no clue that it was just this simple. To get past this area, I, I right. didn't realize that. Um, well, it's, I don't know. Played the original then. What's uh, <laughs> what's what's funny? What's funny is they definitely took stuff from Ghost Tsushima because if you're running around in the open yes. world aspect, sometimes like an owl or what, like a bird will fly oh, yeah, past that, you. Yeah. And you just follow it. It's like that's directly out of Ghost of Tsushima. It is. Yeah. There's there's a lot like of that, different things that they've taken out of certain games. That was one of the ones. That, it was just on screen as well. It takes you to the. Um, Oh, one of the, the the big blue gems. I don't remember what they're called. I've found only like three or four of them so far. The surveillance gems or whatever they call them. Survey. I don't remember what they're called. Um, but you guys know, yeah, there's, there's different aspects of different games that come out of it. You know, Spawn, the other question I have for you, you know, before we switch subjects, is is this is something that, shout out to B-Money. B-Money's been on the show a few times. You know, maybe one of the reasons for the, the game selling the way it's selling is, and I know a lot of people aren't used to hearing this, but there's a lot of games right now, Spawn. There's a lot of games coming out, uh, and and TC kind of nailed it. I've twice now in the past week been really kind of settled down, you know, had a, had my had my drink. You got your popcorn, you got your whatever, your almonds, whatever you like to snack on, 
while you're about and to you play. You want to serve democracy. Well, that's it. So I'm sitting there. I'm ready to go into Final <laughs> Fantasy 16. I get right in the middle of a quest, or I just finished a quest. I'm feeling the story. Everything's going great. And then it's just ping, 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 ping. I got friends hitting me up. They're like, let's go over to Helldivers 2. Uh, you're not usually up this late. Let's go. Let's go. You know, so like, you get pulled off from that. Uh, we do have, you know, Rise of the Ronin coming out in, in, in a few weeks. You've got Dragon's Dogma, which we're going to talk about shortly. You've got uh, Stellar Blade coming out a month after oh, I that. About Stellar Blade. I mean, and I'm not that, that you may say, well, Mooch, that's fine. But 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 Final Fantasy is out now. But people are watching their wallet these days, especially yeah. when it costs uh, roughly $65 to take a family of four to McDonald's. So, you know, it really is one of those things, Paul, where people, I think, are maybe being a little bit more cautious with their spending. Do you think that maybe, and again, it's hard to put this into words because when you say this or you hear it, you go, no, that's crazy. More games, the merrier. We don't want to have a drought. We don't want a drought, Spawn. But when you have two or three games that are going to end up being critically acclaimed, coming out month after month after month after month, it does wear on on titles and, and, and spending from the consumer, would it not? Yeah, but I, I feel like that that's the other part with Final Fantasy and kind of its position now versus you could even say Final Fantasy 13. When a Final Fantasy game came out, that that's all that people cared about. That was it. It's like, alright, we're getting Final Fantasy. I, I don't care what it rise the run, no one that can wait. Like it Final Fantasy used to be the system seller. It used to be the thing that would take up all the attention. Yes. And I, I don't I don't feel like you're saying Helldivers 2 is was going over it for you recently, right? Like I, I feel like that's not how it used to be for Final Fantasy. It it was the de facto mm. release. Like games would look out for it. It wasn't the other way around. So it seems okay. It just seems kind of it seems different now for the the series. I don't I guess, know. It's, I guess uh, it's, I guess I almost want to agree with you, but because I'm from your era, Spawn, it's just depressing to hear that. I agree with you though. I mean, it, it, maybe that's the case. I, there's not a lot of games that I pick up and then like a few days later, I'm 30 hours in. That doesn't happen often. <laughs> but like when Final <laughs> Fantasy comes out, I still have that mindset for it, where it's like, okay, this is the game. This is I'm, I'm going through it. And to its credit, it's it's delivered so far. So I mean, I, yeah. I'm happy with what I'm seeing. Yeah, no, absolutely. Welcome, Death Singer, to the show, too. Death, I appreciate you being here with us. Singer is always great to have on, especially as we go into our next topic here. Uh, you know, Singer, I'll ask you real quick here. I know you're still muted, so you're probably getting yourself situated. Uh, yep. Singer, what have, have you played? How you doing, buddy? Welcome uh, to the show. How, how Have you played a little uh, Final Fantasy VII Rebirth at all, Singer, since we last spoke? I have not. Nope. Uh, there's so much, uh, so much going on right now. Resigned to, I'd probably wait till it inevitably comes to PC because mm -hmm. I got Grand Blue Fantasy going on, and then there's other games releasing, but then there's Dragon's Dark Number Two coming up, so I'm kind of like, yeah, I'm never gonna get around to it at the moment, so I'll <laughs> well, just wait. All you did was just pad Spawn Wave's uh, stats right there, where he made a good point where before when this game would come out or a game of Final Fantasy, people would put this to the forefront and, and everything else would get pushed to the back. And maybe that is something that we have to kind of monitor as we move forward. I still think at the end of the day, I won't make this a doom and gloom session at all. I really do believe Final Fantasy VII Rebirth is going to sell very, very well throughout the course of the year. Uh, I just think because right now we're using one stat and that's the uh, Japan sales charts. And I think, and that's physical as well. So I would, I'll, I'll definitely hold my vote in my, my, my opinion on the overall status of this game until we get some digital results and at least four weeks goes by and we see what happens in the UK uh, throughout other parts of Europe and of course, you know, the U S um, but yeah, if nobody else has anything on this, I will kind of go into dragon's dogma too. And singer, I guess I'll put you on the hot seat for being here uh, right now because you said it yourself. You know, one of the things I was having a conversation with earlier today was, I, I'm actually going to take your stance, but I'm, I'm, I'm reversed. I'm going to put Dragon's Dogma, even though I'm very, very excited to play it, that's going to go a little bit further back on my back burner, Singer, because I feel even the PC version is going to have some, some frame rate issues or some performance issues out the gate. So I'm going to wait. I'll probably play Rise of the Ronin. Uh, come March 22nd. Don't, that does not mean I'm, I, I mean, I'm going to play Dragon's Dogma too. Very excited. But when it comes down to it, I know you're a PC, PC gamer, but I'm asking you this question from a console perspective first, then we'll go to PC. 
Console gamers who are looking forward to this are going to be, and I have the quote here because I got yelled at. I was told I have to have the quote, and I'm probably saying the developer's name wrong, so feel free to correct me. This is his quote. The game has an uncapped frame rate, Itsuno said. He says, we're aiming to go at or around or higher. I like this. We're aiming to go at, around, or higher than 30 FPS. That is for console as well. There are some functions that you can turn on and off. But there aren't multiple sets of options that you can change at once. But yeah, the frame rate will come uncapped on all consoles. Now, Singer, after that, that's end quote. After that, a lot of people got a chance to play three to five hours worth of this. And people were saying that when they hooked it up or they did whatever they did and they did their analysis, it was between 31 to 33 FPS. So he wasn't, he wasn't not telling the truth. He said at around or higher than 30 but anything between 30 and 35 i think most of us in the gaming community would say well that's 30 you know what i mean you're at 30 so how how would you answer and, and listen i know that me and you talked offline last week and we talked about how we could tweak our pcs to you know getting as close to 60 frames as possible with this game but for those that don't tinker with their pcs or don't have pcs Is this a wait and see for console gamers and playing this game at 30 frames? Spawn even said when he was playing Final Fantasy VII Rebirth on on fidelity mode, it looked amazing, but within a few seconds of spinning around, it felt like you were spinning underwater. 30 frames can feel like that after you've played 60 frames for quite some time, Deathsinger. What what do you think about this? You are correct. Um, But unfortunately for the people with the consoles you really don't have an option like you don't have a choice yeah um the only other choice you have is what digital foundry said about um where you could use the vr mode on xbox because the range is low enough where it can as long as you've got 120 hertz uh monitor or tv but you could use it for that, which will probably help out. But because the PS5 one is too limited, VR won't even help. Okay. Um, so you're kind of like, uh, you just, I mean, 30 is what it's going to be. And is that acceptable just, though? And I mean, I put that in, the, I put that in the, in the, in the topics. I put, I put it down on the runner there below. Is that acceptable right now? I mean, what shouldn't there be an option to even bring it down to? I, I'm saying this. I'm not a developer. I don't pretend to be one, and I didn't stay at a Holiday Inn Express last night, singer. So I don't know. But couldn't you put a 1080p, you know, sick or close to 60 frame type of situation? Even What's if it the was resolution uncapped? it's on right now for 30 fps. It's 1080p. I would imagine TC. No, what's the resolution it's on right now for 30 fps? I would assume it was a dynamic 4K of some sort. And whenever I say that, I'm ranging somewhere. And you guys correct me if I'm wrong. Spawn, you're here too. Spawn, you've taken enough machines apart and put them back together to be your, uh, the own gaming engineer on, on YouTube. Is this a situation, Spawn, where it's... Are we seeing 1440, somewhere between a 1440p and a 2160p resolution? Oh, I'll wait for Digital Foundry to to take a look at it. With they'll, they'll later Spawn. on because they'll they'll start that conversation themselves. Um, I'm, sure I'm sure they will. Um, but yeah, yeah. I, I guess my my question then, Spawn, you don't have to give a number. I'm not holding you to it by no means. But I mean, uh, TC made a good point. If if they're capping this thing or they're they're not capping, I hate to say that they're, it's uncapped. But if it's floating mm-hmm. somewhere between 30 and 35, would you assume that we're somewhere in that? Are we in that 1080p to 1440p range, or are we higher? In just your personal it's, opinion, it's probably some. It's probably some weird number that they'll measure out, like 1260 or so. But right. my thing is, if it's floating between 30 and 35, that sounds like a worse idea than just capping it at 30 and say it's. 30. Yes. I, to me, you're going to get some weird looking frame stuttering. Like it's going to be very strange. I, I feel like, or at least gonna, it's going to feel weird at times. It's going to depend on what's happening on screen. Maybe sometimes it's in the forties just because you're staring at the ground or something or just walking in an empty field. But I, I feel like it jumping all over the place like that would have more of an effect on you than if they just capped it at 30. And yep. you know what? That's the way it is because we're doing X, Y, and Z in the world. And it's, 
taking up so much of the compute power and that they, they would probably give a whole bunch of reasons why but at the end of the day it's a 160 120 240 you, you go to pc and that's just that's probably what they would push it as consoles convenience you give up some of the frame rate go to pc break out the the 4090 and go for, go for the you know it's funny so spawn i don't blame i don't blame david i'll give you the mic in a second but it is funny i make this point a lot on this channel and I, I hope it sits well with the audience, is we are all in the gaming community. Everybody knows who Spawn is. Everyone is here in the audience right now. You're listening later on. Your ear is to the ground when it comes to gaming. And if you do happen to have a Switch, PS5, Xbox Series X, and a gaming PC, you probably, if you're listening to these shows, have some something above a 2080 or a 2070 Super. And that's fine. But a lot of people don't, you know? And, mm -hmm. and that's where I kind of... I, 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 I know, Spawn, you have a piece, but like for people that are maybe pulling like under something under a 2070 right now, right. they're going to have to make major compromises as well with Dragon's Dogma because even the PC specs that were coming out in the 4K range were still ranging at that, that 30 frame. I do, I do find it kind of interesting that we, we, we just, so every generation, well, past couple generations, we start and then we go into it and we're seeing games that can touch 60 frames per second and we yeah. feel like the generation is just going to that's going to be the generation the entire time <laughs> yes then we move out of the cross-gen period <laughs> and all of a sudden we're back to 30 again <laughs> and it's just that it's interesting that the, the many of the developers for some of these games are, are just they're fine with 30 it's it's very interesting and i'm i'm wondering if it's if it is deeper than just changing resolution sliders as right. i feel like a lot of assumptions are made with that yes. to where they're not going to sit down and explain every bit and piece of why the the frame rate is where it is but different things happening in the world especially with an open world game like dragon's dogma 2 would obviously affect the frame rate but i it's it's you would start the game development and say we're gonna go for 60 frames per second and then we'll, we'll figure it out you know along the way with whatever compromise compromise we need to make but i guess now because there is such a focus on how good can we make the game look? It's like, well, the the mainstream is fine with 30 for the most part, or mm -hmm. at least the ones that aren't necessarily online or as plugged in. I'll tell you now, they they don't they don't notice it as much as a lot of us do. And they just kind of go, well, that's just the way the game runs, and that's it. So so one hey, mooch. Go ahead, singer. The problem with that native 4K30 thing is they it's in the recommended. Um but if you have like a 40 series card. Yes. You're you're using DLSS anyway, probably. Correct. Um, right. So you can have an output at the native 4K, but you you got it down at like 4040p or whatever mm -hmm. is what the resolution's at. So you're never really uh, getting like there there's there's so many ways to manipulate the game on PC that like the recommended never really is what it is that's just recommended no okay i, I don't know many no, people I understand. Who follow it so a lot of people <laughs> a lot of people in the pc community always say then undoubtedly what we should get on the console side is more options so that we can kind of tinker with the game the way that we would want to do it is that is that a logical choice for future consoles mm. or pardon me future games not future consoles the problem is this is closed box, so like, what's in it is in it, and you cannot change what's in it. A PC, you could change out the graphics card tomorrow. You could change out the RAM, the motherboard, the CPU. Like it, it, you have the freedom, understood, to become as powerful as you want. Yes. Whereas the console, so, when you buy that box, that's it. That's what you get. So there's uh, no change. No, there. that's a great point, Singer. Thank you for you brought reality back to it. TC, I'll ask you a question, TC, because this is something you kind of get into the the weeds with on 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 Twitter a lot. Uh, is, is you'll have your predictions out there. You'll say PS5 Pro. You'll put a number out there, and you'll say it's just a prediction. So take it easy. But you know, Singer makes a good point. And, and Spawn, get ready because you and David, I got to ask you guys this as well. But TC, I'm interested to hear if this is the case. And you have the ability to go out tomorrow and build a PC, and you can put a 3090 in there. You can put in a 4090. You can put in, a, you know, it's the, the 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 sky's the limit. Why is it we keep getting upset as console gamers? I say this all the time. Why at the beginning of every generation, and if they want to do a mid as well, that's fine too, because it doesn't matter. Why don't we have consoles? Everyone's like the console has to cost 
Now we now we're okay with 500. But remember, back in 2013, it had to be 400. So it's 400. Then we dictate we say 500. If they make an all powerful, if they came out day one with a PS5 and a PS5 Pro, okay, edition. Which by the way, like the iPhone. Just so you guys go, Moose, give me an example of what you're talking about. Every single September, when they do their WW um, uh, DC event over uh, for Apple, okay, they show you, you mean the iPhone. June WWDC, the Worldwide Developers. Well, don't conference? they don't they do it in June and then they do it again in September? September is when they show uh, the so hardware. So June yeah. is when they show the software off. Yeah. So well, I'm talking about the hardware. So they'll okay. say like this upcoming September, they'll say here is the iPhone 16 and here is the iPhone 16 Pro. And there's definitely a cost gap. But there's more in the there's more in the box. So my point being is why don't they offer us more of a console jump? So you have a $500 box and then at launch they could have had something out there that's much more powerful that maybe was I'm going to throw this number out there, $700. You don't have to so buy I, it. So I I've seen that that iPhone comparison a lot of times and I think people need to look into the use cases for a console versus uh, your phone. Like my well, phone. I, I didn't I, mean it as I, far as a phone one-to-one -one TCH. I was just trying to give an example of another company that does yeah. a regular and a pro model at the same time of launch. That's all I was trying to say. Oh, not the not that we're paying thousands of dollars. No. For, not that point. No, oh. I'm just trying to say. <laughs> so, Because listen, Debt Singer himself, I was talking to Singer, Singer I won't reveal, but Singer's like, I'm upgrading my PC. And I just did. So what I'm saying to you is people who, who constantly say to console gamers, you need to build a PC. You, know, you need to build a PC. They're telling you to spend minimum $1,500. And that's minimum. I mean, really, I, I think, I mean, Singer, you tell me if I'm wrong. Singer, you're, you're the PC guy here. If you want a decent experience, decent, it would be $1,500. I think it's really these days with, with, with inflation and cost, you're probably at $2,500 for okay. If you want wow, you're over three grand if you're starting from scratch. So, I mean, if it depends because if you, it's cheaper if you build it yourself. Yeah, but I built um, mine. If you it, wasn't, the parts it wasn't and then cheap. Put it together yourself. Yeah, I built mine. I bought everything on Newegg, everything on Amazon, and it wasn't cheap. I mean, it was. I mean, was that was. Was that when the graphics cards were inflated? Well, I mean, I built, my, I built mine in 2018, and then I've upgraded parts accordingly. Okay, yeah, but yeah. even in 2018, you know, the graphics card was uh, 12.99. So, so Moose, are, are, are you are you going to the point of releasing uh, several options at the same time and whoever wants to pay for the higher option can pay for it? Yes. Yeah, okay. I'm, who, who has a problem with that? Well, I mean, it, I, I don't know, but why aren't they offering that? And, and shout out to Kenneth uh, Satterwhite. He says, damn, Moot, you're out of touch. With what? What am I out of touch with? I bought these parts no, myself I, on Newegg. I, I don't it, know what I what out of touch with. The price was there. I, I bought no, it. I, I think they were referring to the the how expensive the the stuff was and like people. That's why people choose. I don't think you were debating why people choose console over PC. But no. I think people are making the point that like people choose console because of the the price. The price. They don't, they don't yes. want to spend two thousand, three thousand uh, dollars on a PC. But I, I I get your point actually. That now saying. Thinking about it, I've seen people, so many people, still to this day, on my PS5 Pro videos, saying it's too early for a PS5 Pro and they haven't tapped into the full power of the PS5. And I'm sitting here and I'm like, do you not see these 30 FPS games? And I, we don't, we, we want, we want the fidelity with 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 higher frames. That's 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 what we want. If you don't want to pay for that, mm -hmm. then you have that option. But it seems right. that people are making this theory that because a Pro comes out. They have to buy it. You don't have to buy it. You don't have to PS5 buy it. Is, it's, gonna, it's still going to be supported. They're still going to release games for it. I even had but, somebody uh, putting out a comment, and I think it's just somebody maybe new to the gaming sphere, and maybe they didn't play the PlayStation 4 and Pro and uh, Xbox One and One X. They had the feeling that with the PS5 Pro comes out, Sony would stop caring about the base PS5. And I'm like, no, the base PS5 would be still more important than than the pro for them because that's where the player base is. Yeah. Um, so I think people just have some things confused. You don't have to buy a PS5 Pro. There's options, and I'm with you, Mooch. I if they released the 
you know, a console every two years that's more powerful, but they'll still support a base console for the same right. amount of time as a regular console life cycle, but, say seven years. Yes. Uh, I'd be there. And honestly, I'd be one of the people that would buy every two so, years. Well, so, would, so would I. And I'm not saying that's cost efficient to the company because David's no, probably going to come. No, because you can just yeah. buy a PC at that point. David's going to say, get out of here. They're never going to do that every two years. I get that. Yeah, yeah. But but the, the point of the problem I'm going to have here, and again, I want to get the panel's thought because I like, I like the tangent we're on here. Is I have a feeling, and TC, I want you to tell me I'm wrong. That's fine. But I have a feeling when the PS5 Pro comes out, I still won't be able to play Dragon's Dogma at four, roughly a 1440p solid 60. Like I, I feel so, like I feel like the mid-gen upgrades are barely a squeak over. Like they, you, you, when you make an upgrade, you have to upgrade the GPU, the CPU. They're not going to touch the CPU. I bet. So the thing is, the CPU, all they're doing from the rumors is they're over overclocking it. So it's not a new CPU, which people have have pointed out would be a a bottlenecking issue. I'm not a PC gamer, but this is what I've seen from like channels and stuff like that. Um, but the PS5 Pro, one of the the biggest things for it, and it's going to be a big thing, but most likely in the next generation, uh, is AI and uh, um, okay. okay the upscaling technology. And the thing about it is, upscaling is supposed to t levy some of that. Some of the so, some of the performance, and I don't know if it's actually going to happen or not with the PS5 Pro, uh, the uh, dedicated upscaling tech. If that mm -hmm. happens, that could alleviate some of the performance and you know uh, give you higher frames. I think the Dragon's Dogma Two situation is literally their engine. It's their their engine. If if you can get other open world games, I don't know what's so. I, I haven't played Dragon's Dogma. I don't know what's so special about that game that that. Like, that makes it so so in, intense but again it's the engine in my mind because like if you can have a game like horizon looking as good as it does and i know somebody's probably going to check me and say no dragon's dogma has so much detail and you could do all of this i don't know it's dragon's dogma a physics situation is it a starfield situation that's what i was going to ask you it's the same situation right it, the same thing you're saying with the engine is that that's probably the same thing that they ran into with starfield yeah, the engine. The engine is the the issue. But I I know I know people made the point with Starfield where they were saying um, there's so much physics going on, and they had all these milk cartons for some reason. Yeah, <laughs> they're trying to. Yeah. They're like you can move every little item all around you, and I'm like I don't know how much that matters to the player at the end of the day. Um, but people are making the point that uh, that's why it was hard for them to get uh, you know 60 FPS. But Starfield does it doesn't yeah. it run 60 FPS on on PC? But I, I think that was yes. just because you Starfield, have more Starfield yeah, it, on PC it, does. Yes. It, it does. It does. Yeah, yeah. The, um, yeah. it's, th it's 30 because, I mean, the CPU in the consoles is all right, but it's not the best. And this game seems to be CPU bound, not GPU bound. Because yeah. the CPU is higher than the GPU on the recommended. Like a 2080 in 2024, as the recommended, is really really low compared to some games that have come out so it doesn't seem like it's gpu bound it's more cpu bound mm -hmm. and does it have a lot of physics it, stuff in it i don't know i've never played Dragon well, yeah it does uh well okay. from what i can tell from some of the preview footage it's like they randomly picked up like a bomb and threw it at a wall and it broke the dam and killed the giant so oh wow the they must be destructible. yeah there must be some interactions with the world um, What's now, I don't know if that was scripted. Is Dark Arisen the just Dragon's Dogma? The first one is just it's thirty frames on the PS5 and the Xbox Series. Like they never did any kind of patch to raise it. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's interesting to know as well. Yeah, so it must be. So, so the first game was thirty FPS as well. That's what Spawn's yep. saying. So, yep. so Spawn, it is an engine issue then. We, yeah. Oh, I, I just I, I I don't know. Maybe <clears throat> it's weird to me that they never went back and patched it. You feel like you you do a patch and it'll it would run at sixty because it like if you play it on a a Steam Deck or ROG Ally, you can get higher than thirty frames in that game. So it's it's interesting to me that they never went back and did that. Maybe there is more of a reason to it. It's it's hard to say. It would yeah. be fair to to question whether it's a um. Sorry, I've been sitting here listening to this. Uh, and I thought I'd just throw my two cents in. Please do. Is it fair to question the developers and the, the creative um, process early in the piece to say if they've taken the compromise approach of instead of going for frame rate and performance, 
we're just going to add umpteen bajillion new things on the screen just in this pursuit of making it look amazing. Because if, if they've got so much stuff on the screen and they're, they're offsetting compromise because of the limitation of power that they've got available or the limitation of processing power they've got available, is we can't crank this thing up to 60 FPS because we've got too much crap going on in the background. Obviously, that's a design choice. So it, it, it's at what point do we stop saying the hardware is the problem and it's not the developer's engine that's the problem, it's a creative choice that's been made and that's then difficult to climb over. You can't even brute force that necessarily um, all the time. Because right, you're right. There's no way they're going to... The gonna... first game is still 30. Yeah. But what's the, what's the point? Where's the, where's the economic benefit of going back and solving the problem to bring it up to 60? That that's, would be the first consideration as soon as someone fronts up and says, hey, we want to do this. It's like, all right, how are you going to pay for it? Oh, uh, well, we just like to do it because creative-minded people like to do creative things. Engineers like to fix problems. And the finance guys and the business managers, the first thing they say is, how do I make money out of it? So you, you got to get in that triangle somewhere for these things to happen. Now, to, you, you were correct, Mooch. If there's no way in hell that they're going to do consoles every two years unless there's a business benefit to do it. Right. But, you know, f- upgrades... Every fourth, third or fourth year, you know, with the way the technology advancement goes, that makes sense. If you can get manufacturing uh, benefits out of it to, to reduce your costs. They've already done the heat sink in the original PlayStation. I think they're on their fifth iteration. It's nearly half the size of what it originally <laughs> yes. came out with. Yes. So, um, and, you know, the new Slim's got a slightly smaller chipset to it. Um they're talking three nanometers or something for the for the the pro potentially, or the six is looking at something stupidly small like that. So, um, as long as there's a an economic benefit or a business reason yeah. underpinning a lot of those sort of hardware side items, um, you will find that more often than not, the good ones will get through and the bad ones won't. But it always comes down to, and it's whether the software development or the hardware development, what do the engineers that fix problems, the creatives that want to create, and the business people that sign the checks, getting them all on the same page and in the same zone to say, yes, this is a good idea, let's do it. Because if you've got to make a compromise, like we can only make the game run at 30 FPS, but we can stack all this awesome stuff in the background and make the entire environment engageable, why don't you change your art style so that you can run it at 60 FPS and you're not chasing, um, you know, photo realism? Because if the game loop, if the gameplay loop is fun, um, it'll be fine. Grand Blue Fantasy Relink is a great example. That thing runs at 60 FPS and it's not trying to be, you know, photo realistic, but it's mad mm-hmm. fun to play. <laughs> so. <laughs> Go ahead, Singer. Probably for marketing. No, probably. It's fine. The, the, the problem with that is you could sell graphics. You can't sell frame rates. Like, on the trailer, you can't sell 60 FPS. But I can sell you a game that looks absolutely beautiful, and you'll look at it on your OLED and go, wow, I need this game. So, Singer, but- Singer you say that, but let me ask you a question. We talked about sales and diff- different, completely different sales category conversation. But will this... Locked, or pardon me, not locked, uncapped, but very, very close to 30 FPS console performance issue. Will this will this hurt sales? Uh, no, I don't think it will. I think people who want to buy the game will buy the game. You see it a lot of time. There's some games that are kind of dodgy in the frame rate department, but or they have or games have issues at launch. But they still sell millions of copies just because of what they are. Um, like, tons of games now come out with issues, regardless of what they are. Mm-hmm. 16 had its issues. You have other games that have issues. Hogwarts Legacy had issues. Um, like, all these games have issues, but they sell millions because people don't care. They see it and go, oh, I want to play this game. Bye. Okay, cool. Um, and on console, you don't have the choice. Now, on PC, you could brute force the 60. You, they they can tell you 30 all they want. And mm-hmm. it's like, ah, that ain't going to happen. Whatever, I'll just put it in. Turn this on, turn that on, job done. There we go, there's my 60 frames. 
Yeah. Um, but console, you don't have that option, and that's you. You own the console, obviously, for you want the ease of use. So you just accept the fact that it'll be thirty and just move on with your day. Like I'm sure you're not you're losing. Sleep I think. I think if you own a PS5, and I see where you're coming from on that singer. But you know, it's funny as the days go forward on the PS5 era that we're in. The the days of just thinking games are going to come in at thirty. That was. Maybe as we were going into this generation, we maybe had some doubts that everything was going to be 60, but a lot of games ended up being 60. Spawn makes a good point as we kind of leave the cross-gen era and go into full PS5, Xbox Series X area. This is where now we're going to start to see certain games. But again, a lot more of the games are proving to have a performance mode that still hits that 60. We said that Final Fantasy Rebirth doesn't look as good as it should in performance, but yet it's still there. And I'll be honest with you, I think Dragon's Dogma 2 looks like one of the most hella fun games I've seen in a very long time. I, I don't I don't think it's graphically in like great. I, I don't I mean it didn't look like it was leaps and bounds like ahead of the other games we're playing right now, this generation. I mean, Singer, you can tell me if I'm wrong. I have no problem being wrong on that. It looks good. It didn't look I mean, like it's phenomenal. It's no horizon. It's not horizon, right? You know, I mean, no. By the way, that doesn't. I also want to clarify. I I don't think it looks bad. But what I'm saying to you is what you said earlier when you were like, you know, well, if it's not this, then it's that. So you'll have these great. Actually, it wasn't you, Singer. Me and Spawn were going back and forth about Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, where you can go into fidelity mode, mode and it would look absolutely amazing. Like it's, it looks like a painted picture. Then you go to performance mode and you see some drastic differences. In this case, I think it's a hybrid when it comes to Dragon's Dogma. The footage I've seen, I wasn't blown away necessarily by the the resolution and the graphics. I was blown away by the scale of the world, the story, the lore, uh, what you can do with friends, how it's four-player co-op. I mean, to me, that's what really is selling it. So it's not really the most... I don't think it's going to go down as one of the most beautiful games of the generation. I mean, do you think that's the truth, Singer? It, it, it looks really, really good, but it's not going to go down as the most vi- the visual showpiece of the gen. No, right, right. But it, it's it's going to be in the game of the year conversation for sure. Oh, abs- That's absolutely. The, the end of the year. Listen, visuals are not going to get in the way of of, of a game yeah, of the yeah, year. No. I mean, it takes two one game of the year a few years back, guys. That wasn't visually stunning by no means. Uh, a lot of fun to play, by the way. Shout out to Joseph Ferris, uh, Sir X Men. The great Sir X Men's Persona games have been overtaking Final Fantasy. You know, Spawn. I don't necessarily think, and shout out to the great Sir X-Man, Spawn, I think when you were saying, you know, Final Fantasy may be losing a little bit of its, its, its charisma and charm with some of the younger folks, I don't know if, Pers- I don't think Persona's taking over. Persona, uh, I mean, I think Persona is clearly trending in the opposite direction as Final Fantasy for its series. Like after what we saw with 5, I do want to see what happens when 6 comes out. Just just because then you can obviously tell if it's I mean, I don't think five was necessarily, a, a, you know, some kind of flash in the pan for him <clears> because three reload seems to have uh, gotten a lot of hype and excitement behind it. But that I'm, I'll am i be curious when six does release, if it still continues to have that same kind of push and excitement behind it. But uh, I, I think Persona is, is definitely building up, whereas I'm not sure about Final Fantasy right now. Yeah, it, it comes back to that. The style of the game, the gameplay loops and all the rest of it. But it, 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 we're getting into a point there where the, 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 the flashiness and the anime style of Persona is attractive in mm-hmm. a lot of different markets, whereas Final Fantasy shifting away from that uh, characteristic... Characteristics is a horrible word to explain it. That... <laughs> caricature in that style and trying to move more to the um i don't know like the, the real life simulation style stuff is is probably having an, in, an impact as well um but then you know turn-based versus action-based um you don't get the big flashy stuff all the time you look at how good um uh, like a dragon had, when when it went from action to turn-based when they introduced ichiban had a massive, massive uplift in, in yep. certain um, zones uh, and different in market market segments. Um, clearly, turn based is attractive to a lot of people, but you know it's uh, yeah. But I, I feel like Final Fantasy is. I feel like Square with Final Fantasy, what they'd expect out of it 
is on another level than even Persona. Like, they're probably looking at Final Fantasy thinking, this should be a 10 million unit seller. Just outright. Yeah. Absolutely. And I, 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 don't, I don't know if turn-based, like, just strictly traditional turn-based would get them there. And I, they kind of talked about that with 16, where, uh, where Yoshida said it, it looks weird because we're going for these hyper-realistic visuals. Or like these top of the line visuals, and then they the characters stand there and look at each other while a bar fills up. Like it doesn't <laughs> doesn't line up necessarily with the kind of the presentation we're doing here. That's that's how they kind of explain going to this action based formula. Right. So I maybe maybe the move is to stylize it more and and make it to where you're going into it not expecting a Game of Thrones kind of style. It's it's more yeah. flashy and sort of. Uh, uh, over the well, top, and, the, and they go that route instead. That's what Sayer yeah. was think, saying. Singer trying to hit saying... that balance, I think, is what where that challenge for Final Fantasy VII, um, the trilogy, is going to be sort of the, the, the do or die point from my perspective is they're trying to balance the nostalgic parts whilst bring it forward into an action based, whilst not losing its character, whilst expanding the story and all that sort of stuff. To get that balance right, I think they're doing an exceptionally great job so far from what I've seen. But it it comes at the detriment of we may not get this every single part of this trilogy to be a ten million unit sell, and they just need to be comfortable with that. And we won't know if that is what they're expecting or not until six months time. Yeah, I think remake got to like seven, and yeah. th- th- and now we're seeing with rebirth, which I do wonder if people bought remake got to the end of it, saw what happened, and they were just like, that's nah, enough for me. And they just <laughs> didn't come back for Rebirth. That's like, enough. there are people who are actually pretty mad at what happened, or just, like, really mm. put off by it. And I, I do wonder if that had, a like, a legitimate effect that maybe Square wasn't expecting. I mean, what it's... Was the, what was in the... In order uh... to make it a trilogy, they, they decided to, <clears throat> yeah. to kind of flip things well, in the fourth wall-breaking way. Uh, I got to the yeah. end of... I got the end of the first one, and I sat back and watched the credits, and I vividly remember saying this to the wife i said i don't know if they're making part two and three or what they're doing because none of us knew at the time i said I, I don't know what they're doing but i'm just happy with that that is if that's all we get i'm content and that i was I genuinely said that i was content if that was all we got but then you know six months later we found out we were getting part two and part three and oh no it wasn't six months it was nearly like a year and a half later we found out so well yeah i mean okay. it was- I was pretty happy with it, but I do know people who were like, no, nah, I don't like that. That's that. That's not what I thought this was going to be. And then they just, died. they didn't come back. Go ahead. Go ahead sir. <laughs> wow. I, I, yeah, I, I didn't hear, I didn't hear that negative response one. I'm, I'm actually shocked mm-hmm. to hear that. I mean, I totally believe it. I, I don't remember that. Maybe it's just something I wasn't paying attention to. I there thought were was- some, there were some hardcore final <laughs> fantasy fans who were really split on it. I will say that. Well, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, w- I was one of them because some of the people that I talked to in the Discord, you would probably know Mooch. Um, mm-hmm. When I initially came into it, into Remake, when they announced it, was, oh, this is going to be a remake of the original story. The game I played back on the PS1. Mm-hmm. The, the Final Fantasy VII I fondly remember. Playing when I was younger. Which got me into Final... Final Fantasy VI got me into Final Fantasy, but... Anyway, um, seven was the crowning jewel, in my opinion. And then some people played it and was like, "Hang on a minute, uh, yeah, they've taken some creative liberties, they've changed the story up, they, you know, they're going in a new direction with it." And that was when I checked out. Me hmm. personally, I checked out. I was like, "I appreciate what you're doing, but I wanted a remake of the original, and you're going in a completely different direction." I mean, don't get me wrong; it's a good game. But it's not exactly what I wanted. So, if no, they'd have know. taken, if they'd have taken Final Fantasy VII the original and just did an upgrade to it to a graphics. degree, let's call it an upgrade graphics and whatnot. But they used the same engine. I'd have been very content if they'd have used the same engine they've used for Octopath Traveler. Just yeah. Yeah. get us up to that nice, crisp, clear. Great frame rates, good visuals, just bring us out of the pixel art and up, or the voxel art or whatever it was and up to that because the backgrounds would have been the same. You would have seen that very vivid, you know, 3D on um, pre-done backgrounds like 7, original one was. That would have done great. 
and they could have done that as well as what they're doing if they really wanted to start sucking money out of people. But um, that was what a lot of people were expecting, um, as, as um, Death Singer is saying. That a lot of people weren't happy when the creative freedom that was taken and it comes in really early. Um, it did turn me off a little bit at times, but uh, you know the, the nostalgia of the music and, and just the high notes in the game's key story points um, is what kept me in, ingrained in it, but yeah. I, I'm more along the line, I can't remember who said it, I don't remember if it was Spawn or it was TC or David, you may have mentioned it. I'm just there to see what's going on next. I want to see what's happening. I, I, like, I like what they're doing with it. I... I I like change in that sense. I'm not one of these people, as I get older, I just have to clam on to the old, old, old. So if they're doing something new, uh, now don't get me wrong, you have every right to critique. If they also change the old and they change it for the worse, well, we're going to talk about it. But I think right now what they're doing, I've enjoyed the ride so far. I think it's been great. I do have uh, the great Sir X-Man also saying get a little bit, oh, an older gamer here. He says, Mooch, I'm loving Tomb Raider Remastered. I'm old. Uh, you're not old, uh, Sir X Man. You're young at heart. That's the way it is. It's great to hear that you're enjoying that. Now, Brian East has a, a conversation here for the panel, and then we'll change subjects. He says, I have to ask the panel on this one. The Last of Us had issues with CPU limitations on PC when it ran fine on PS5. When that lended the idea that PS5 can deal with potential CPU, lim- pardon me, CPU limitations and optimize. Well, you know, Singer or Spawn or whoever, you know, you guys are on PC a little bit more than I am. The Last of Us issue with PC was, I think that was strictly on the developer problems, right? That but, was. That yeah. Was abs- that, that is on them. The, the, the problem is with PC, obviously, can't, they don't optimize for consoles. But to, to be fair to them, this was their first game on PC. So, um... I can because it is on Naughty Dog, The Last of Us on PC. That is on them. That's specifically. right. Um, but uh, it's your first time, you know, your first outing. So I'm sure you're going to get it wrong. Veterans on PC still get it wrong to this day. Um, but it, of course, it'd be optimized for the console because that's what they made it for, and then you'd port it to the PC. Um, so the console version will be running pretty good, sweet, and then. The Last of Us, that whole issue is, that's the whole thing. That is completely on the developers, and it's just, you know, you, can't, you hit and miss. And then it's either on the modders to put in some fixes, some patches, mm-hmm. and whatnot to cover up what the developers did, or, in the case of Cyberpunk, um, and Elden Ring, for that matter. Um, but then you had... They, they they actually fix it with the how many patches they pushed like five to PC right? It took them five I, attempts at least to get five, it really yes. good. Yes. Um. So, yeah, <laughs> consoles will always have the better experience because the, these the first party will always optimize for the console first, mm-hmm. then port it to PC. So, of course, you know if Nixus well, does a game though. If mm. Nexus is the one porting it, it always comes out beautiful. Well, Nexus is the so, one that's doing the Ghost of Tsushima port. They, they also did which ones? They did Spider Man, right? Yeah, I believe so. Yeah, who did Iron Giant do? Iron Giant did one of them. Iron Galaxy. Iron, Iron Galaxy. Galaxy. Iron Galaxy. Sorry, that was Iron Galaxy. Did, did um? That was the last, last of us. us. That was Last of Us. Yeah, yeah. and then Nexus is doing Ghost of Tsushima. Next, <clears throat> yeah, Nix is when I think Singer says it best. When when Nix is is involved, you know you're getting a you're gonna get a quality product. Yeah. yeah, subject matter experts doing what they do best. Yep, which is why I'm always really, 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 really relieved to hear. For the most part, I know that the games as a service and the live service games and the games at Concord that are yet to come out this year are all gonna go PC and PS5 first. By the way, I encourage that because you <laughs> a live service game is only as good. As the people playing it. So that's not a, you know, but when it comes to a single player game, I like how they're able to have the home studio squeeze the most out of the console as as much as they can. And then letting Nixus later on take that game after the originals are done and put the game on PC 12, 24, 36 months later. That's up to them. Whatever they decide, that's their world, not my world. But I like that idea of still giving the console a reason to exist. I know a lot of people still don't like that. I, uh, that's maybe me being old school. That's fine. Uh, I think that there's there's value in that beyond just the console wars. There is value in that. Um, 
We've got the great Spawn wave here. And Spawn, I know that you've basically been like uh, the media covering this. Uh, everybody goes to you for Nintendo news. I got to ask you, this was a big deal. The Nintendo emulation lawsuit with uh, Uzo, I'm probably saying it wrong. I always pronounce everything in terms of Italian. Uzu. Uzu, thank you. Um, Uzu. Yuzu, thank you again. Spawn, what's the good, the bad, and the ugly to come from this? Because it's not just as easy as Nintendo won. There's, there's a lot behind the scenes when you peel the onion back. Well, it was a, it was a case Nintendo brought against them like a week ago, and yep. it's already it's already settled. The, the team with Yuzu decided in like 24 hours after filing an extension that would have run until, I believe, the end of April, that it wasn't worth going forward with and instead they decided to pay nintendo 2.4 million dollars and shut everything down and along with that because the user team is also behind citra which is a 3ds emulator yeah that got pulled down and there's also tools that they created to install stuff on the 3ds there's tools that help you pull your keys from your switch all these things being linked to them that also is is all been pulled down or in the process of being pulled down it the stuff's re-uploaded so you, you can still find it. it's not like it's, it's impossible to find it's it's all over the place but still the the principle is that nintendo technically figured out a way to take down an extremely popular switch emulator without actually going after the emulator itself so the the idea is they realized that yuzu the team was doing things like collecting a patreon and there was word that they had locked certain features specifically fixes and patches for things like tears of the kingdom before tears of the kingdom came out yep behind patreon posts so you had to subscribe and you get the latest build that sort of thing and then they also it, it sounds crazy but nintendo infiltrated their discord basically and was able to pull all kinds of messages and different things that they had posted in there that seemed to imply that they were aware that there was legitimate things like piracy going on using their tool because Tears of the Kingdom wasn't out, but they were still fixing and working on it. And how do you do that unless you downloaded an, a copy of it? So Nintendo put all this stuff in front of them, and it was enough to make them fold pretty much immediately in 24 hours. So, so that's fine, uh, Spawn. But but at the end of the day, does this put a little bit of fear in other emulators? Or no, this is uh, this is just going to be uh, a one and done. Oh no, it's definitely put concern i would say and that like there's a, a ds emulator that was being charged for on android called drastic and the creator made it free pretty much right away and then said it's, it's coming down in a few days mm -hmm. so they they're just hey if you want to download it go ahead it's and they said themselves it's not worth the hassle or potential risk that it poses where nintendo decides one day that they don't like that ds emulator so they call, you know, their hundred some odd lawyers that are on retainer and they just they just take you down. If if not with them being right with the, the fees associated with it, which if Yuzu was in their mind, the best case scenario was for us to pay two point four million dollars. It does make you wonder how much Nintendo would have attempted to take from them. Like Nintendo took the URL from the website from them. <laughs> like you got they had to turn that over. <laughs> okay, well that yeah, that it, puts a big stop on it. Go ahead. I apologize whoever took the mic from. Oh, you're right. I was just going to say, it, it's one of those, if we can't beat you, we'll beat you up with it. Um, and, yeah. the, and the consideration there is they accept that they pay the deal, take everything down, declare bankruptcy, and walk away without paying a cent. And Nintendo gets their win, and they really don't care. <laughs> yeah, from, their the ashes, from their ashes, though, we saw two more come up. And they'll always, they'll always be emulators. It's like cutting the head off the Hydra. You cut off a head, two more will take its place. Hmm. And me personally, I swapped from Ry uh, Yuzu to Ryujinx anyway, because I personally think Ryujinx is better than Yuzu. Um, but it's... I don't know. It, the way Nintendo went about it, they ran this around as a W. And it is, it's like, yes, we took it down. But... E there is, there is always going to be an emulator, I would think. There is always going to be one. So unless you want to spend from now to the end of time trying to take down emulators, which is possible. They do like but, the courtroom. I mean, yeah, they do like the courtroom, but do they want to spend the next 50 years going back and forth to the courtroom? I mean, 
Uh, I mean, they they might, can. I don't know. They they do a lot of that for some. They they're really inv- invested in that core room. I mean, to be fair, I have to give it to them though. They did make that uh, that one dude in debt for his entire life. So yeah, I would imagine in- wages garnished forever. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. they play a very different game, and let's not forget they operate in a very different environment to what most of us are used to working under. So. They they don't they don't muck around when they want you. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah I mean, I'd be I'd be slightly concerned for Ryu Jinx, just slightly, like just a little bit. I I if I were them, I'd be real careful about that Discord because I'll tell them now. Nintendo's already in there, probably. So you know, I, I'd be a little little worried about. Just just be careful about what you say to each other in that Discord. <laughs> Well, that that's kind of my point because I honestly I'm sitting here listening for the first time. I don't I have I don't I never. Did any of the emulation? I did. I don't have it on my Steam Deck. I don't have it on my PC. I don't have anything like that. I, uh, I'm, I'm just old school. I don't know. I, I don't even. I know what it is. I'm aware of it. I've seen the videos of people on YouTube being like, "This is how you do it," and, that's, and I think that's great. Um, but like, where does where does it, in your opinion, guys, where does it start and where does it end with where Nintendo could go? Would Nintendo ever go down to the user, um, or, or, or you know, not a user being like you or someone that's listening but i mean like someone that is like promoting it and do think is does, does nintendo ever go that far where does the emulation thing start where does it end i'm, I'm asking i'm genuinely curious i have no so idea they they've gone after rom sites and one and once again like millions of dollars in terms of fines and legal fees okay. just because they were using nintendo's own intellectual properties like they had mario and bullet bill and stuff on the banner that was enough for oh, them to okay. just go Slap them with some, you know, some paperwork, and okay, well, that that website's gone now. So they they have all this stuff ready to roll. Like the if they want to, they send you the file. They knew that the Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom, and they apparently had proof of with ISPs and that sort of thing mm-hmm. that the game was downloaded a million times before release. Tears okay. of the Kingdom just being played on this emulator. Then apparently another million were attempted, but the download wasn't completed. So like they're the, Nintendo is going to hire private investigators. They'll do, they'll, they'll invest the money because they know that they'll come out of it with, you know, so many in fines and the PR and the, the future deterrent that it provides for them going into their next system, which is probably the thing they're most concerned about. If we make another switch to say, and it's still using a Tegra, it's a little newer. We want people to think twice about Mm -hmm. emulating this thing, right? Like you're going to invest this kind of money into it this time. Just know that you slip up once and we'll be there is is kind of the way that they're trying to portray this. Yeah. So and it's funny. I'm learning a lot here and and, and singer, maybe I'll poise the question to you. So shout out to thrifty uh, PS gamer reviews. He says, Mooch, most emulation is theft. My question for you singer is how come when people put emulation as the topic, it's generally referred to, in the Nintendo space, I don't see emulation. I'm not saying it's not happening. You're probably going to say, Mooch, it's, it's definitely happening. But I don't see it in the Xbox PlayStation category uh, oh, as much. I do. Is it you do? Okay, no, that's I'm asking. I don't see it. But inform us. Like, it, it, where where is, is emulation biggest and r- running rampant the most in the Nintendo IP? Or, or is it equal amongst all? I mean, you can emulate whatever these days. I mean... They they have a PS3 emulator that they're That's trying right. to get yes. off the ground Good with. There's been a work in progress for a long time. There's you have the Xbox emulators now, just you know, with varying degrees of success. But it's mainly if you look at like the PS1, the PS2, f- fully fleshed out. You have the entire library on there. If I want to go back and put, problem is like, how do you play Need for Speed Underground 2 right now? How do, how 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 do you play this game? So you either plug up the old console to your TV yes. and play it that way. <clears throat> oh, that's it. That's your only choice. Because there's no... So if I want to play the game, I could just so emulate it and play it. But so, the Nintendo is mainly in the conversation because they're current and new. It's current and new. Everyone, you know, like playing, oh, I want to play Tears of the Kingdom, but I want to play it at 4K, 60 FPS. The Switch can't do that. No. But you could do so that on an emulator. Here's the, here's the funny thing. Need for Speed Underground 2, you can buy it on PC specifically, but you need to have it with the CD key. It does exist, though. You, you can buy it. 
I've it's just, old, it's like, it's like $80. I've got an <laughs> old, can... old Pentium 486 sitting somewhere that I used to play Need for Speed Underground on when I was at high school. It is funny though. You, you technically can buy it. You just need the CD key. <laughs> oh, I can go into all that. I'll just everybody sit. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, that, that's, that's so what it's... most people will do is it's not available. Whatever's to emulate. That's fine. So, so and I... you could use it for the PSP, PS Vita, mm-hmm. all the Nintendo handhelds. So it's pretty much game preservation. I was just going to say that. That's what people are kind of, that, that seems to be the shield a lot of people hide behind. They say, listen, it's game preservation because I can't, I can't get these games any other way. Myself, personally, I don't, I just don't feel, I don't, this is me, I don't feel comfortable doing that. But I mean, I, I, I'm not here to tell anyone what to do or not do. I just think that that's, uh, it's one, is that something that you can hang your hat on, you think, is to say game preservation? Because a lot of these games that Singer mentioned He's right. You you cannot just walk into a store and and buy. I don't believe some. You you mentioned Spawn. You can, uh, you know, online. That's the but concern is is that games just disappear because there's no obvious way to access them. Like the 3DS, that Citra emulator is probably the one that really stung for most people because the the 3DS in general is just it's considered legacy by Nintendo. They they're shutting down online play next month. The store's already gone. Uh, and then you do still have some weird stragglers here and there, like mm-hmm. that aren't available on PC. Alpha Protocol, very strange, not available on PC, <laughs> and uh, it's it's stuck on the 360 and the PS3 generation. It's never moved off of that. So, like in ten years, it would be even harder to find that thing unless there's some sort of release on Steam out of nowhere for it, or they remake it or remaster it. But do, do they really? Does Sega really feel the need to go back and do that? Probably not. So that it, you can you can argue preservation in some cases. Other times, though, I will say I think it's like it's preservation, but they're downloading, you know, Tears of the Kingdom or something. <laughs> yeah, Tears so. of the Kingdom is yeah. breaking records on yeah, uh, downloads. Uh, so that that is a good point. So I guess you know, and again, uh, David, what do you think when you hear this? I mean, you're again, you're our our, our dollars and cents guy. Uh, you know, when it comes down to it, you heard Spawn. Spawn actually didn't back down from it. A lot of people would say, oh well, you know, Nintendo wanted to prove a point. And now they're done. But David, it, Nintendo may not be done. Maybe they're going to do this a few more times to try and prove their point and then, you know, sit back into the shadows again? Or, or... Well, it comes down to what, what's the impact to the business. Right. Um, you know, you, you remember when the PlayStation 5 launched and it was backwards compatible for all PS4, but then there was that big uproar about, well, why doesn't Sony buy such and such an emulation for the PS3 and just plug it in as a service um, mm-hmm. so we can get back to the PS3 games that are locked on that that platform that we've hardly ever seen come off it. Um, it's it, If there's a business case for it to do the emulation internally, then they would have done it. It's the same with Nintendo. If there's a business case there that makes sense for them to do it, they would have done it. Clearly, there's no um, it doesn't stack up internally for them. If external parties want to go down that pathway of, of doing it, um, aside from all of that, is it pirating, is it theft, is it whatever, put all that aside for one minute, is it going to cause financial harm in any way, shape or form to Nintendo? And it, it doesn't, you know, technically from one cent of lost revenue, it's creating harm, but that doesn't mean that it's worth Nintendo coming along with the big stick and the bunch of lawyers and setting them off and going, right. go forth and, you know, devour. It needs to be worth doing. Clearly, this particular one was worth doing because of the potential for it to cause uh, revenue loss and and other bits and pieces along with it, not just today, but in the future with potential upgrades to technology and all the rest of it, as you know, TC and Swarm of and Death Sing have all said. Um, it's, it's whether it's got any credence, are they going to keep doing it? Who knows? It depends on what's out there at the moment that could cause that kind of damage. Do they want to cut a few off at the past before they get the next console or the next handheld or whatever it is, the Switch 2 or the Super Switch, or hopefully they call it that? I would love Um, it too, yes. That'd be awesome. Um, They don't need to, you know, it's not so much about reputation as much as it is about the reputation and revenue and impact of potential future sales and the impact of emulation on new games and, you know, missing out on all that stuff. Um, 
because remember, Nintendo don't sell stuff. They don't discount it all that often. Um, That's right. And if you've got some top um, top line games, like uh, from memory, and don't quote me on this, but from memory, 2023 financial year, Nintendo was 60 or 70 something percent of their revenue came mm-hmm. from first and second party IP. So either yeah. games they built internally or games they paid someone else to build that was their IP. PlayStation is the total opposite. Six, 70 odd to 80% of their revenue comes from third parties. They don't make huge dollars from first parties. Mm. Um, so there's a completely different um, driver for Nintendo to go out there and stomp anyone who's taking their IP and making money out of it because, you know, a million downloads of Tears of the Kingdom at, well, what is it, a 50, is it 50 US dollars? It's 70. 70. 70 US dollars. Mm-hmm. 70 <laughs> US dollars a million downloads. There's a 70 million bucks going straight away. Right. So, you know, shout out to Chad Studd in the chat. I know one of you mentioned, I heard one of you say, it, it, due to it being a paid, he says, Mooch, you have to remember the specific emulator had a paywall. Normally they don't care, but the company was making $30,000 a month in Patreon donations. So I know one of you was saying it in passing quick. Did that? Put this company a little bit more under the radar that they were making that much money. I mean, that's that's a good amount of money a month. Absolutely. Yeah, I would think so. Yeah. Yeah. Now, the the, thi- um, Singer, the one that you partake in that you said uh, that that right, is is that one also a Patreon? Do they uh, are they under that same particular uh, pay scheme or no? I haven't noticed one. Um, because it, 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 it isn't the same as Yuzu. Um. I, I've never paid for the latest version of Riot Jinx. I've never had to cough up money. I just get the latest version as and when it comes mm-hmm. out. Um, but I haven't. Nothing's been locked behind a paywall. Um, in particular, so Ryu Jinx does have a Patreon. Uh, it doesn't make thirty thousand a month. It says it makes two thousand a month, but they they do have one. Oh wow! Okay. Yeah, th- th- that, that's probably why because no one, no one's that. Let- no, I've never really noticed the Patreon. Like, it hasn't been, mm. oh, get the latest here, because um, it's just, it never popped across my thing. That's mm-hmm. what, well, when I was using Yuzu, you knew they had a Patreon, but I didn't even know Riot Jinx had one, because I, I yeah. never looked into it. I just downloaded I, I, it. I'm looking at, like, their, their, so their tiers. One of them is an early bird one. And I do notice that you, they say you get early access to progress reports and a priority support channel. That that's potentially something that could get them into trouble. That that's what I mean. They just they need to be very very in tune, or at least be familiar with what happened just now. And I'm sure they are, because let's say that support channel provides. All right, so this print there's a Princess Peach game coming out in two weeks or something okay what if in that it, it leaks early and in that support channel somebody shows up and asks about it and they fix it then that that's something that nintendo kind of caught yuzu for so that that's the only thing i would be cautious about if i was ryu jinx so blessed blessed red in the chat i don't he says mooch read my two comments here so i'm reading them i don't necessarily know if i agree with this he says someone pirating a game is it necessarily going to correlate as a loss of a sale? He says some people pirating the game would never buy it in the first place. Well, you know, if I'm going to go into a store and I'm going to take a candy bar, uh, I'm still hungry. Uh, if I couldn't take it, I would probably buy it. Right? I mean, I, I don't know if I necessarily think that it, it doesn't, I guess it may work for some. Do you guys see his point? Does, does his point hold water to you? I, I don't. I don't see it. I, I see his point, but I think it's the there's some complexities around it that that may be overlooked. Um, yeah. One of those being the right to access um, via the license because the software we're talking about here. So there's a license to access. I was actually chatting to um, Retro about this last night while we were playing Helldivers. Um, digital versus physical. The, the, the CD still got a license to access the software. Um, digital, there's a license to access the software if you've bought that license. So we're not talking about subscription services here where you pay a fee to lease the, the license for as long as it's in the service. We're talking about own, ownership. If you've paid for that license, to, and if you you know a weirdo like me who likes to read those agreements, um, you'll see that there's 
parts and clauses in there that say you have certain obligations and the company you've bought it from has certain obligations. If you own a physical or digital license, it doesn't matter. You are afforded their right to access that game, that piece of software in perpetuity, unless there's some force majeure thing comes about that the entire company just disappears for whatever reason. But in some instances, someone would have to still provide you that software. If you have not got a license to access that software by either purchasing it from the company, purchasing it from a reseller, purchasing it from a friend, or just being gifted it to you from a friend, which still has a legal value attached to it, if you've just gotten a license that technically doesn't exist because it hasn't been issued by said company that, that owns or has to provide that, that, um, that software, you're not... You're not in a spot where you can go, hey, I've just got it because I would have got it otherwise. Right. You actually have stolen something. Um, Now, whether that is enforceable or not, most companies won't bother if there's no money being made and we get back to the conversation we just had. Right. If you're making money off stolen property, that's when people care. If you take something, keep quiet about it, keep it to yourself and don't brag about it, nine times out of 10 or 99 times out of 100... That's a really smart thing to do because then no one's going to care because no one's going to know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that's probably In sound advice. Yes, I have s- the thing I run off, and this goes to some of the stuff I saw in the chat. Mm-hmm. It's, it's people say it's pirating, stealing, but let's say, uh, like Fire Emblem Gauge. I go out and buy a copy of Fire Emblem Gauge. Yep, I come home. And I'm look at my Switch, and I'm like, so I could play this at 30, 30 FPS and sub frame rate. Or I could quickly download the copy now to run on my na- on the emulator and right. play it at 64K. Right. Did, did I steal? Because I went out and I just bought the game from the shop. So I came home with the game in mm. my hand. So if I download the copy... That's There's interesting. No so you're you're almost saying uh, I I like the way you're. I'm, this is hypothetical. You're saying I went out, I bought this item. It's at a lesser quality, but when I opened up the case, it you know hypothetically had a coupon that you could go and emulate it for a better upgrade. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I mean, I, I. But the thing is, though, that's true. Uh, and and I guess with your particular situation, I don't know. If, I don't think that's necessarily bad. But the problem is, there's no way to track that. And that's that's where the question comes in, right? Because we can't track that's, that. That's, I mean, that's always been the question, is you know. But I would think that the amount they that's a great idea. sell Singer, Singer, far outweighs that Singer, which has been. Singer, if I was yeah. Nintendo and I was listening to this show, I'd be like, "That's genius." I want in the Nintendo eShop, I want to be able to have my own emulator for for preservation, right, of games. And then when you buy it, we give you a code. You go into our store, you put the code in, and you can have it at 4K60 if you have a PC that's capable. If not, enjoy it on the Switch. That's outstanding. Singer just broke the... He just solved everyone's problems. I mean, I'm serious. It's funny, but that's that's actually interesting. Well, they'd do it if they could make money out of it. Well, they would. But listen, David, David, they're making money on it. Like to 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 just have it uh, to give a digital download in addition to your physical purchase, that's that's p- pennies. Oh, it would be unless you put it behind a paywall and call it Nintendo streaming well, yeah, or Nintendo whatever the hell it's called, well, and then maybe, charge people extra. That's for That's true. It. That's true. They may it may be behind the the ten or, or twenty five dollar a month paywall for Nintendo Online or whatever they want to call it. So it's, there's a bit of double dipping happening there, but. Nonetheless, it's still that's an interesting thought, Singer says there. Because Singer, your point is is valid. The problem is tracking. Right? It's, that's the only real thing I'm seeing there. I think that's interesting. But it, but it does count as a sale towards the game, which could be tracked by Nintendo. So yeah. if I buy the game, that's a sale to Nintendo. I can now go home, emulate the game. Yes, but I'm saying you have to emulate. That is still it. a sale. Yes, but you'd have to emulate it on their storefront. Oh no, no, no you, you just emulate it on PC. You you have the game in front of you, and you you could, if you really wanted to, you could offload it from your Switch onto the PC yourself. You could do that yourself. Um, well, I guess I'm, yeah. I'm using the wrong terminology. I'm saying if they had the same, they opened a web, they had a website that you could go to that's Nintendo. And you, it would be the same thing where they have the emulated version of it for PC. 
but you put the code in that was in that you got from your purchase. I'm being hypothetical. It's, I'm going down a, a very yeah. tricky that, rabbit that, hole. That's a rabbit hole Nintendo would never no, go down anyway. Probably not. Probably maybe, not. Not maybe, maybe, but maybe not. Because remember, with music and DVDs, you used to have that. If you owned the original, you could make as many copies as you liked because the license allowed for you to do that. As long as you still had the original in your possession, you could copy it as many times as you like. And same with the what Death Singer's um, putting forth. In right. most most countries where the license agreements are consistent, as long as you have paid to access a license to access that software, it does not matter how many times you replicate it or how many t where you're replicating it. As long as you still have possession of the original license, you can do whatever you like with it. Yeah, no, sh shout out to uh, King Thresh King. I'm not sure if you're on a delayed... You may be listening to what we were saying earlier. The, no, he said, wait, so you're saying if you rob someone and the victim doesn't say anything, it's okay. Uh, that's, not what, that's not what Singer's saying. Singer's saying if you buy the game, much like David's example with the music there, where you can make copies otherwise. So you can't... I don't know, but copies would not work with a video game. But you'd be able to go and put that in. I'm saying Nintendo could make a fortune off of that if they ever did that. Where you buy it, and then you have proof of purchase, and you get one download on their emulating system. I'm, I'm calling it their emulator. It'd be their storefront for PC, and you could have 4K60. It was funny. Some people in the chat are like, oh, my God, Nintendo's going third party. We're, we're just, these are all hypotheticals. But, but, that would be a way, but that would be a way to track it. I'm just trying to say, that's the one thing with emulation. People say they give all these excuses, but the, the one thing that is, that's not trackable right now. The only way to track it is if you bought something through Nintendo. You'd have to make the purchase, like Singer said. And then be eligible for that 4K60 downgrade by Nintendo through Nintendo. That's the way I would I would look at it to be the only way for it to be legit. I don't know. Again, we went down a rabbit hole. Uh, I do want to ask Spawn a question here before because we are over the two hour mark here. Spawn, one of the other things that's been very big this past week and in, in the past two weeks, and I'm curious to hear your take on it. I, I think I know how some of the panel will will handle it, but one of the things is exclusives, right? And I know Spawn that this comes up. You know what? Every six to twelve months, we'll get one of these great topics. But what do you think, Spawn? When someone says to you, "Exclusives are," and I don't want to use the word. People say like anti-consumer, but like Nintendo has their exclusives, PlayStation has their mm -hmm. exclusives, Xbox has their exclusives. Yes, Xbox is now dabbling with the fact that their exclusives may be going to other platforms. But you're hearing some people in the media saying, "Hey, you know what? Xbox is doing it." Nintendo and PlayStation should follow suit. Like games should be everywhere. And again, maybe this is just me being old fashioned, but like no matter what other industry we're talking about, it it doesn't it doesn't really work that way. Like I I can't walk into a Ford dealership and be like, "How come you don't have any GMC pickup trucks?" Like I mean, you sell trucks, right? So, it doesn't matter if you're talking about burgers, trucks, shoes, clothes, anything why is it all of a sudden that everybody wants i understand and, and, and they're saying well what microsoft's doing microsoft is is making a pivot to possibly test the waters as a very large third-party publisher so i don't think you know maybe for some in the diehard xbox camp are saying oh i don't like this i get that but microsoft will still be a very large publisher moving forward xbox isn't going anywhere they're just gonna maybe maybe not have the presence on platform as much if they go that route Spawn, where are you on the whole exclusives in the, in the way things are moving forward uh, after Xbox made their business announcement? Well, I mean, I think exclusives are just a, a proven, tried and true way to get people to your platform. It's worked for decades. It'll probably keep working. And I the, the one with Nintendo is funny because I feel like Nintendo is like the most old fashioned when it comes to that. So... I always feel like they would rather shut down than have Mario on a PlayStation. Uh, but in in their case, Nintendo will continue down the path they've set where they just have exclusives on their hardware and probably dabble with the cell phone stuff here and there. Uh, but PlayStation, the thing with PlayStation is I feel like they'll keep con or they'll keep playing around with PC. Eventually, they they may find their way there day one with a game that's a single player title. But I, I think. At least for this generation, it'll mostly be live service stuff because they just need the player base to keep it keep it moving. And with Xbox, I don't really know why you would see Sony necessarily prioritize PlayStation games going to Xbox when the reason that you see Xbox doing it right now is just because they're 
there was just a, a growing and large player base there, so why wouldn't they try it mm -hmm. uh, in their mind? So I, I think for now, exclusives, I, I get people, there are people who don't like exclusives. There are some that do, because if you have an exclusive that actually uses the hardware like specifically and correctly, it general genuinely, at least in the past, it's given us some pretty good games that were, I don't say only possible in the hardware, but mm -hmm. like, for example, you might see a game from Nintendo that uses the Joy-Con in some interesting way and you go, well, okay, I guess that's, that, that's, that's a game that is only going to work correctly on the Switch. But then you get stuff with the DS and as we just talked about game preservation, it only really works well on a DS because there's two screens, you know? Right. So it can be good. It can also be a hindrance for the future. But as long as to me, you get an, a, a unique experience that feels like it needs to be on that platform to be like, to get that full experience. And that's why it's exclusive. Then I think that makes a lot of sense to be there. But for Nintendo, well, I guess Xbox is the big talking point. They just, they want to sell more copies. That's kind of it. Like they, yeah. their platform. I do wonder what their digital physical split is. I feel like it's ninety ten at this point, and I uh, I think a lot of that is people just subscribing to Game Pass and and using that. Yeah, as like the mainstream. I, th I think yeah. that's where a lot of their time spent. They're they're two very different, very different business models and very different issues that they're facing. What's well, this three? If you want to include Nintendo, PlayStation, and Xbox. Xbox has got a revenue issue um, and their marketplace position sort of dictating that they need to branch out onto the other consoles, notwithstanding that they already had, you know, um, agreements in place with Nintendo anyway um, prior yeah. to the ABK acquisition. So this isn't necessarily new information. We all knew this was coming. Um, but, yeah, PlayStation's got a cost issue and Nintendo's got a, we got to get new hardware out and try and not die doing that. So. That's the problem with Nintendo right now is I, I feel like they think they don't need new hardware. Like they're not pressed for it. And that means that there's no new hardware still. <laughs> and yeah. it, we're in the eighth year of the system <laughs> with a chip from 2015. And Nintendo is still going to probably sell almost 16 million systems this year. Yeah, they're still making decent, decent money off it. Um, it's downturned a bit, but you know, their impact is, is negligible because their costs are almost non-existent. Yeah. Um, it's actually quite crazy when you look at their, what they've got. They're, um, they're pork barreling for when they have to launch the new one because they know it's going to cost them a bomb. Well, you know, Singer, let me ask you that question because I know that you predominantly play on PC and you always say, well, Mooch, I'm just going to wait for the PC version, which is fine, by the way. Um, it's more than fine. But I'm, I'm saying to you, when you hear this exclusive talk, I mean, you know, me, myself, I have a capable... PC, I told you what specs I have. You said, Mooch, your, your PC is more than capable of handling a lot of the games that are coming out. I, I just, I, I generally will, like I could have bought Hell, um, Hell Divers 2. Just use it as an example. I could have bought that on PC or PlayStation. I, I bought it on PlayStation. It's just, I pick up the controller. It's easier for me. My PC, yes, I even have it hooked up to one of my TVs. So you're like, well, you could just do, which they used to call big picture mode, but I, you can still get, a, get right up to your PC. It's fine. I do that. But for some reason, it's just easier for me to boot up the PlayStation. I enjoy gaming on it in the family room. Also have movies, music, everything on there. Whereas when I when I relate myself to PC gaming, it's like I am right now podcasting. I'm at my desk. I've got my monitors. It's just you're in an upright chair. You're not laid back. Because you want to get all the fidelity out of your PC. I want to use my 4K 144 hertz screen, right? I want to pull as much as I power as I can and, and get the best looking game I possibly can. So I don't sit there and play it on the TV. I play it on the the, the best um, uh, material that I've purchased for the PC. So when it comes down to it, at the end of the day, exclusives matter because for me, it justifies the reason for having that box, right? For a lot of reasons. Yeah. If, 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 if um, Uncharted and God of War, and every Sony game, and every Nintendo game, were everywhere, I would just, I think everybody would say this. The boxes, and we heard David, and we heard Spawn a minute ago, Singer, the boxes would cease to exist, and we'd all just build a PC, or buy a, a pre-built. So, the thing, how do we oh, defend not having exclusives when, when you're talking about companies that depend on hardware sales and accessories. I mean, the uh, the the PlayStation, for example, the Edge controller, the VR two, the Portal, 
the various headsets, all of that kind of goes a bit away if there's no box. The problem with that is PC is not for everyone. And that will remain true to the end of time. There are some people who, you know, they work 12 hours a day yeah. or 10 hours or whatever. They just want to come home and game. They That's don't right. want to have to boot up a PC. They don't want to have to... If there's some trouble, you don't have to do some troubleshooting. They would just get a box, put it in front of their TV, come home, push the power button, load up the game, off they go, go on with their life. That will always be true. So, even if all the games were on PC, you would not see a whole bunch of people move over because, for one, there's the price gate... Mm -hmm. Of you have yeah. to buy it to get a good PC. Yes. So you have to factor in that price. Then you have to factor in the... You, you will come across issues, that's a guarantee. So how are you at troubleshooting, you know? Are you going to be there all day on Google, trying to Google up whatever? Do you want to go through the hassle? Or do you just want this plastic box so you can put in front of your PC, pay 500 uh, put in front of your TV, and just go about your day? And... If you're someone who's just into Call of Duty, FIFA, Madden, that plastic box is all you need. You don't need a PC for that. If That's the, right. You play like four games a year. That's right. You, do, you don't need a PC. That's an enthusiast's um, device. So, I mean, the exclusive argument is really mad. Plus, I play PC exclusives anyway. Shout out to League of Legends, 10 years in, and never stopping. Um, but... For the most part, I just wait, wait, and wait for PC because there's other games out at the time. So it's like, well, if Final Fantasy 16 will come to PC in a year's time from its release, or Rebirth, for example, it comes in a year. That's fine because there's so many games releasing that I'm not going to be missing out, and then I could play it at a better frame rate. Like as people have complained about the performance mode for Rebirth, you wouldn't have that problem on PC. Um, so, you know, it's, that, that's the whole wait and see thing. That's why the exclusive argument for me, ever since moving over to PC, doesn't hold any water. It's like, I could just wait. Yeah. All of Xbox's games come to PC. All of the PlayStation's games, I'm presumed, presuming next gen, not this gen, but next gen, day and day on PC is a possibility. And you could get all of Nintendo's games on PC. So it's the all in one platform. Technically, you could get all the Nintendo's games on PC. Technicalities. So, I mean, it's the all-in-one platform, and that's why I have PC. Well, you know, it's funny. I, that's, you, I like how you threw that little caveat. Every, you know, it's funny. So, I think BG said it a couple of weeks ago on, on on Twitter. It's like, everybody's been saying day and date. To, you know, like once Xbox did it, everyone's like, well, PlayStation will do it any day now. Any day, any day now. Any day now. Any day now. Uh, next generation, not a generation after that. And then when it happens, everyone's going to be like, I told you, I told you. It's like everybody's Nostradamus with the end of the world. Then the end of the world happens one day. They're like, I told you it was going to happen. Like you, you predicted it 18 times ago on 14 different dates. Um, I, I, listen, it could it happen singer. You never speak in absolutes, right? So it, it of course it possibly could happen, but I well, always remember feel that. Remember they said PlayStation games our exclusive would never come to PC. Horizon Zero Dawn ended up on PC. So, if if the money makes sense, if PlayStation sees the money, they're going to do what's best. They're well, a business. They have to. They that's a hundred percent right, Singer. That's a that's a thousand percent correct. But like David oh, said, and like Spawn said uh, moments ago, uh, as long as they're dependent on the sales of the boxes, and they know that they can double dip. I, I don't necessarily see why they would, but go ahead, David. I was just going to make a general observation that it's, it, it always makes me laugh when someone says something absolute at a point in time, which is true for that point in time, and then six months, 12 months, two years, three years later, the, the position changes, but they're not allowed to change their mind. That they're, like they're held into... For some reason, people seem to think that, that once something's said, that is it. You can't change your perspective. You can't change your yeah, mind. You can't, you can't change anything. You can't, yeah. And I always laugh at that because for exactly like what they're saying is it, it may not be what they wanted to do then, but they ended up changing their perspective for various different reasons. That's so right. anyone who says 
um, that'll never happen. You're kidding yourselves. It may right. happen. It may. It happen. may not happen. Right. They've told us that they're going to do it with live service games, and they've told us that they're looking at it, and they'll do what makes business sense. That's correct. So to then stand for no, no one on this panel, I should point out, no one on this panel has done this. Um, but there are those out in the community who stand on that soapbox and thump their chest every day going, it's happening, it's happening, it's happening. And like you said, one day they may be right, but it's a self-fulfilling prophecy that they, all these, all three of them have already said to us, we will do what's in the best interest of our business. That's right. And if it's day and date on PC for something, <laughs> so be it. Yeah, so um, be it. But I got to tell you, my, my opinion, David, and this is, this is, I'm trying to just use the map that we have in front of us is currently uh, we saw we we have the blueprint. You know, D David, uh, you've done business. You guys have all done business on this panel. When people see a blueprint, Xbox gave the blueprint. They went day and date, and it it takes time. It doesn't happen in 24 hours. It started in 2016 with Quantum Break, and here we are today. Xbox One was seemingly their worst generation. And the Xbox Series consoles are selling less than Xbox One. So what I'm saying to anybody that's listening is, David's right. When they finally see that the numbers, and Singer's right, when they finally see that the numbers make sense to go day and date, they will. But I would say that that would go in conjunction with, that would be when they cease, they cease the need for the box. They don't need the console. Because hey. Hey. Xbox... Got rid of the. They said they said you don't need to buy a console. Guess what people did? They didn't buy it. So when Nintendo and you heard Spawn say it a moment ago, they're working on you know they're working on what's going to be the Switch Two, the Super Switch, right? And, and and they're they're dependent on that hardware as much as they're dependent on their software selling. If that's the case, day and date, Xbox has already shown those roads were paved. And, and it didn't work. It, you, the double dipping didn't work the way they wanted it to. That delay, as small as the delay may get, maybe we'll go from 24 months to 12 months to 6 months. But that's a big difference when you're talking about the hardcore community. You still give the hardcore community the reason to go buy the console because people who are hardcore, you heard people, I have tons of games. I have so much to do. I have no time to do it. But I'll be playing Dog, uh, Dragon's Dogma. Right? Like, they don't want to wait. Singer, you're rare that you say, I don't mind to wait. You don't mind to wait, but others will, they'll be damned if they wait. So it, it gives a purpose. And that's what I'm saying. So people have been saying since 2016, 2016, Sony will do it any day now. They could do it in PS6. They absolutely could. You never speak in absolutes. But I would think that the day that they do it, they would have to know that the, the days of the console would be somewhat a thing of the past. That's not necessarily true, and here's why. Sony have been super successful with the whole world, world garden strategy. This is our little garden, our mm -hmm. walls are tall, mm -hmm. you can only get your games here, and this will sell the consoles. But if you've noticed over the past couple of years, those walls around the garden have started to, you know, they're a little bit shaky, or they've decreased a little bit. You know, Sony... PlayStation themselves are expanding a bit more. Mm -hmm. Like, you, you wouldn't have thought you'd ever get first-party games on PC, but here we are. They're on PC. And Hiroki, he, he's, you know, he's the money-cruncher guy at Sony, and he's second-in-command to Yoshida, so he, he's well up the chain. He's kind of like... He even, he even in his statement kind of threw Bungie under the bus and said they're great creatives, but they don't know shit about business. Um, so, and now you also have their budget, Sony, uh, PlayStation's budgeting issue right now, where the budget's starting to get a bit out of control. So, they, they got multiple things, and they might find a way to alleviate some of what they're going through, would be put our games on PC, because there would always be a group of PC players who will never own a console ever in their life, and that's true. And there'll be a lot of console gamers who will never ever go to PC in their life because they don't want to have to deal See, with all the issues. The first part, you're, so, you're saying, the first part holds water. The, this whole people who don't have a console will get a PC and the people who have a PC will get a console. I mean, there's enough people on this panel that already will debunk that because you will not play on console. 
Like, so it, it, you are one of the, you are a PC owner that won't buy a console. There's enough people on no, the panel no. that have a console yeah. that don't want a PC game. I have three or four people in the chat saying, I will never PC game. So I understand there's always the what ifs. The first part there with um, uh, uh, Hiroki, he, what he was saying though, but he, he's an interim, he's an interim person. They asked him questions that he never gets asked, you know, because they're like, well, you're going to be the new gym for four months. Yeah. So he's what does he talks? He talks dollars and cents. He t- he's in, he's he's the money guy. So he's going to talk money with you guys. But like the thing about it is, at the end of the day, when they hire that next person, that next person will make the decisions. He will be a contributing factor in the decision making process for sure. But the other person will make strategic decisions for the best output of the of of the company and and, and for the product. So the. Yeah. The other person, when they do hire them, they will be reporting to Hiroki Totoki. Yes. Because he's, yep. he's, yes. he's the chief ops officer and the chief financial officer for Sony. But Jim, Jim was answering to him. Yeah. And so and, was, uh, yeah. And so was, and so was yeah. uh, uh, all the guys there. I mean, uh, yeah. you know, it's... it's I people, people, people shit on Jim Ryan for being too much of a businessman and not allowing them to be creative. I can tell you right now, if you thought Jim was a shark of a businessman, which he was, you wait and you see what Hiroki Totoki does in four to six months. He is an absolute barber. He's sharpening that razor like you would not believe. And there's going to be some serious outcomes from what he's going to do. Because the creatives creatives uh... were just left to invest too much money in dead-end opportunities um, over the last 18 months. So I I had a... Outline some of my, my thoughts as to how Sony was going to approach the next couple of years mm-hmm. after Horizon got announced. Yes. And basically it was they approach a live service game day and date, which Helldivers 2, that worked out pretty well for them. But I, I do think eventually they find their way to PC and PlayStation 5 releasing simultaneously, but like single player games, everything. But I I don't think it's on steam i i think it's on their own launcher i think they yep. make a, a launcher i think they tie it into the playstation ecosystem so you do cross by kind of like what they did with the vita and the playstation 3 and 4 back in the day and it's it's a way to get pc invested in their playstation ecosystem because if i was sony i'd be i'd, I'd at least be aware that microsoft had sized up valve to buy them and I, I don't know if I'm necessarily all in on Steam where you give them 30% if one day Gabe Newell retires or it is like, I'm, I'm good, I'm done. And then all of a sudden it gets reevaluated. That's a good point. There's a deal in place for Microsoft to buy Valve and Steam. So I, it- if I were them, I would, I would create my own launcher. I would say our games are good enough to get you here. And that's the way it is. Yep. And there's a, there's a given the immediate and medium term outlook on the gaming industry growth which is i say stagnant the the growth is quite minimal prediction over the next couple of years so if playstation wants to grow their revenue if the industry itself is not growing they need to branch out into the other parts of it which is mobile and pc mm-hmm. uh, yes. which they've already told us oh, i think they would have a i think they have a mobile doing it. I think they have a mobile app that would tie that in as well there. I think yeah. it all tied together I, for them. I, I, Spawn, I, I've yeah. heard you say this, and I do agree with you on that. That's how I think if, if they were to go day and date on their own launcher, that way they're making 100% just like they are right now. Trophy support, too, on PC. And it'll trophy tie, support. It'll all tie around. That's right. Oh, well, well, they won't be able to charge for online because that's a bad idea. Don't do that. Don't do that. St- well, don't, don't think you're about the board. Probably, <laughs> they'd probably bring over PlayStation Plus in some degree. They, they'd figure out something they can do with that, most likely. Because I think that, because again, you, it'd be difficult for them to do that through Steam. So if they had a launcher where they control everything, I I just feel like they there have been job listings. They seem to have invested in it. And I think it's just taking them a while to not be the Epic Game Store that shows up without a shopping cart. Oh, yeah. No, no, no one wants to do what Epic did, because when they came into the market, it was hilarious. You didn't even have a shopper cart. Right. I'm like, yeah. And, and <laughs> you're supposed to rival Steam? The number yeah. one? On, but, well, you know, it's funny. I mean, did they, did, has, but, Epic, has Epic gotten better, Singer, in your opinion? It ha- I mean, it has. The launch has gone better. I still don't use it, because Steam's superior. Uh, but, I mean, it gives you some free games, so there's that. Um, but, I've always been been interested in the PC take on this, like people who are really invested in PC for a platform that's so open. 
it's it seems like most of the gamers are so willing to just surrender to Steam as the de facto default storefront that controls everything. Oh, I, I think it's because Steam has a, the, the lot of benefits. You have the workshop, which has a whole bunch of mods in house for your game, so you don't have to go to external websites. But then it has the community. It has um, there's the sales because if you look at like the winter Steam, uh, summer and winter sales, like the really really big ones. You get a whole bunch of bargains at good prices on a whole bunch of games that you're probably probably never going to play, but you buy them because mm. they're so cheap. Um, like the, that's a reality. You have like 500 games in your catalog, and you you, you haven't played half of them, um, and you never will. Um, but Ste- uh, Epic is uh, the benefit mainly is the free games they give away. Um, but yeah. outside of that, they don't really have the same sales that Steam has, so for me personally, that's the way I play Fortnite, is the Epic Games I, launcher. I just I, mean, I, I, whenever, whenever like a, a new launcher is discussed or mentioned, there's there's a lot of pushback to it, which is, it, it's strange to me because the benefit of the PC is the open platform aspect, but whenever any kind of competition would show up that would kind of extend the free market, PC, just in general, gamers just seem so opposed to it. I think it's I mean, I don't want to have to download so many launches. I prefer my games in one place. Uh. So on Steam, like, um, for example, sure, I could buy, like, let's say you wanted to play an Assassin's Creed and mm. it didn't come to Steam. You would then have to go into the Ubisoft launcher. But then let's say you wanted to play a game that was exclusive to Epic. Well, now I have to go over to that launcher and go play that game. And then, oh, they, I want to play FIFA. Well, it's only available on the EA app. So I have to go over, boot up the EA launcher. And now all of a sudden, I've got eight different launchers open. Or I could have all my games just centered into one place, which would be Steam. And it, it, prob- it probably helps the fact that Steam is kind of, you know, it, it came out so long ago. PC gamers are so used to it. Like, yeah, but we, we, we hated it. We hated it when it first came out. Well, yeah, uh, but now it's the de facto storefront on PC. Half Life Two wouldn't work without it. it was well, weird. that's you, ex- yeah. <laughs> you imagine trying to sell a game on Steam at the moment? Oh, I, I mean, mean the, the curation the, is kind of rough. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, four <laughs> and a half thousand, four and a half thousand new games came to Steam last year. Yeah, that's yeah, that's kind of yeah. tough. Well, so I mean, if you're gonna if you're gonna talk consolidating everything into one spot, yes, it's great for the consumer, but it's gonna deter an awful lot of people from making games. Yeah. True, but th- then yeah. again, Steam is pretty good at highlighting indies as well and stuff like that. Like they have oh, the yeah. Yeah. Indie, Steam Indie Festival, they have St- Steam Next Fest, and they highlight a whole bunch of new indie games coming out for this year, or they'll highlight a whole bunch of smaller games rather than the kind of thing, so There's I definitely mean, advantages it's just funny see, seeing a lot of the people in the chat, you know, they, they, they're they like they're like, Singer's doing a really good job of keeping me on console uh, so it's like, you know what it is hey, and, 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 no, Singer, they, they, they don't mean that to say that you, what you're saying is incorrect it, it, it's just that, I think you said it yourself, it's just, it's it's a much you get done with a long day's work, you're this and that, you get to turn on your console. And also, you know, uh, we talked about this at the beginning of the generation. We stopped talking about it because at that time we were talking about, will people from the PS4 and Xbox One era end up staying with PS5 or are they going to be going over the series consoles? But the one thing, the other thing too, is is your friends, right? So that's the other thing with Spawn saying, if PlayStation did make their launcher and trophies and, fr- and basically striking up the PC launcher would be equivalent to striking up your PlayStation 5 and it's almost a apples for apples comparison and your friends list is there and everything just comes over that's you know that's just uh that that works very well for for the common gamer they really really like that i think that that's something that would work that's something right there spawn that you'll hear me say okay day and date whenever absolutely that i can get because at that point sony's making their 100 percent on it everything that you know seamlessly from a console will give a similar experience on a pc you, the console has a reason to exist still. Um, it, it just, I don't know. I think that would kind of work. That's interesting also, too, with the whole fear that Xbox could buy Steam one day. 
Um, shout out to Magnum yeah, Gaming. They sized them up. Yeah, no, you really did spot. Magnum Gaming says Sony will not do day and date on PC for single player narrative games because they use property engines and can take eight to ten years for each release. Hey, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. No, I, I wouldn't. Never. never say never because. Yeah, never say never. Yeah, right. you know that. Disappointment or maybe excitement. I don't know. Maybe maybe it would be fun. Well, to see actually, he says he says that they have proprietary engines, but Decima is already on PC. Yeah, and oh, all they, they proprietary got engines two are already now. on. Yeah, yeah, the only one that wasn't on PC was the Soho engine, which got shut down two weeks ago, and the um, what's the one the Insomniac had? Not the one they oh. use for Ratchet and Clank and and um. What's the other one they have? They've got another engine. The that, one they use for Spider Man, or the one that they use for Sunset Overdrive? No, nah, it'd be the one they use for Sunset Overdrive because the one they use for Spider Man is going to end up on PC in about six months anyway. So, right, there's the, the <laughs> two that that haven't made it are the two that are on the shelf and never going to get used. Yeah, so that the whole engine thing doesn't make sense because Horizon's on PC, Especially Death Stranding's it, on PC. Like, yeah. there's your Decimer engine right there. So, yeah. No, I, I definitely can see that holding water. I did. Uh, I told these guys I would get them on here. Shout out to the great TC. TC's making videos, I think, as we speak. TC, I've let TC do his work behind the scenes because he originally said, Mooch, I can stay for about an hour, and I kept him here for almost three. Uh, I want to say shout out to all you guys that were here. You know, Like I said, this is one of those weeks in gaming where there's lots. We talked some games, uh, games that are releasing, games that are coming out in the first few weeks, uh, first few weeks coming out after the show. Uh, but to be honest with you, it's been a lot of community-driven news, so it's been interesting. Uh, love the panel. Love everybody that was here tonight. Please, guys, hit the like button. Hit the subscribe button, too. Your name comes up in likes. I think we're just surpassing 12,000. Very exciting for, uh, for me over here on the channel. Uh, I'll go in reverse order here uh, as everybody kind of hits that like button while we wait another couple of seconds. The great Dead Singer. Singer, thanks for being with us tonight, buddy. I reach out to you. I know that uh, luckily for me, you do work late. Uh, over there uh, yes. uh, across the pond. You do work late, which works in our favor. So great to have you here again. And honestly, the topics tonight really hit home for you. Singer, let people know where they can find you. Thanks for being here tonight. Hey, no problem, Mooch. Anytime. You can always hit me up. I'm always happy to Thank discuss. You. Um, you know, it's just uh, obviously once you finish work, it's kind of like, oh, they kept me in. Otherwise, because you're not allowed to f uh, phone the warehouse in the warehouse when you actually go in there. Right. You're not allowed to phone on you. So it's locked up in the locker. So it's like, I ain't <laughs> going to see shit see until, <laughs> until break or something. So, um, but on the, yeah, you can find me a death singer everywhere, you know, playing, playing my games. And contrary to popular belief, yes, I do buy my games. I don't steal them. Um, so yeah. <laughs> singer, I like how you <laughs> threw that little asterisk there at the end. <laughs> Asterix is like, he's like, just in case you guys are wondering, I buy my games. Thank you and good night, everybody. Um, yes, yeah. thanks, thank you and good night. Yes. <laughs> Singer, great to have you. Shout out to Bri Brieros. I hope I'm saying it right. Became a Mooch Manic family member. Thank you so much for hitting that join button, buddy. I really, really appreciate it. It means the world to me. Uh, like I said, we we're going to be doing, I, I plan on doing it last weekend. This weekend, I'll have a little bit more time doing a little bit of Twitch streaming, and then I'll be cutting up some of that video and putting it up over here on YouTube so you guys have a little bit more content, so I appreciate that as well. Shout out to Capone. I didn't see Capone's earlier. He says, Nixus, the best purchase Sony has ever made. I think a lot of people on this panel would probably, they would probably agree with you. True, but he also says, this is what I call digital criminals when he was talking about, well, it was back when we were talking about the emulation stuff, so shout out to True, Woody as well. Uh, I also want to thank tonight for being here, the great David Faulkner. David, uh, you know, for us, it's 9.43 p.m. here in New York. For you, you're about to probably start planning dinner over in Australia. Uh, David, thanks for being here tonight, buddy. I really appreciate it. Let people know where they can find you. Uh, thank you for having me. Another great chat. Sorry for talking so much again. No, um, great. You can find me, find me on Twitter at Forky87. Uh, you can find me bumming around on some other podcasts. Um, showing up here when Mooch, uh, when Mooch puts the call out. So, um, yeah, any questions, queries, or comments from, from tonight, hit me up. More than happy to chat. Thank you, David. Appreciate having you here. Uh, TC, are you here, TC? Uh, reaching out to TCMF. If not, I'll give him the plug. There he is, yeah. TC. I know you're doing work <laughs> behind the scenes, TC, and I appreciate you hanging with us. I know you had a lot to do tonight. TC, thanks for being here tonight. It really means a lot. I know you said an hour, and you were very active for uh, the first two hours, and I know you had things to do. So, TC, let people know where they can find you. Thanks for being here tonight. 
Uh, yeah, no, no worries. It's always a, it's always a fun conversation. It's uh, TCMF games everywhere. Uh, Facebook, uh, Instagram, uh, X, YouTube. What else is there? I think that's everywhere. <laughs> TCMF Any- games Instagram, everywhere. <laughs> anywhere you want to find T. Just go look TCMF. You'll find him. His channel's uh, really blowing up on YouTube, and also. His uh, Twitter, uh, now known as X, is really blown up. Go over and check him out over there. He does great, great artwork, too, as well over there, TC. Love what you're doing. Please keep it up. Uh, speaking of loving the work he does, the great Spawn Wave Media, everybody. Spawn it was here tonight. Spawn, outstanding work. Not that you have to hear it from me, but uh, love that you uh, keep us informed. You do a very good job, by the way, Spawn. You should win an award if you haven't won this one already for the greatest news-related gaming personality in a neutral space. Uh, I'm waiting for Jeff Keighley to give you that. Um, Great to see you uh, stay out of the console wars as much as possible, Spawn, and still be (laughs) that much knee-deep in as much of the console conversations as we all get into with gaming. But Spawn, let people know where they can find you, and as always, it's great to have you here on Crossfire. Thanks, Mooch, for having me. You can find me over on the Spawn Wave channel. I'll be around tomorrow morning, 8 a.m. Eastern Time, so you can you can check in. Guys, go over and check out Spawn. He does a great job. Uh, I got to get the behind the scenes on the Spawn uh, studio. I, I've done my thing over here, but I think he's got something that's like industrial light and magic. I got to figure out what he's doing. It's fantastic. That being said, guys, we'll be back next Thursday, 7 p.m. Eastern Time. Go over to twitch.tv, Mooch TV. Same here, same Twitter, same YouTube. Drop the O's for zeros. It's M00CHTV. We'll see you guys next Thursday, 7 p.m. Eastern. Enjoy your weekend. Do some gaming. We'll talk games next week. Peace out. Good night.